the Christopolis. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. I miss you. We were supposed to be recording for the last literal hour, and we just were talking the whole time. Yeah, that's what's how new? Know, that's how you know it's going to be a good episode, though, because we're clearly just ready to chit-chat. We talked about, like, Waffle House, like, finding bugs in your food. We you really like, didn't talk at all. I just bitched to you. I life. reacted with a lot of bleh sounds. <laughs> a lot of cockroaches have followed me to Virginia. I, yeah, I don't love that about you I, I'm not feeling right it. now. No. I, I'm, like, kind of paranoid that, like... One of them like laid an egg on me, and I just carry them everywhere with. It. It's very I kept gross. going the eggs. It's just so foul. Uh, also, if I'm talking, can you hear me fine right now? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Am I too loud? No, I'm talking okay. a little closer to the microphone because <clears throat> my mom actually works in the basement, oh. and she's she's like not necessarily super close to me but i also know that my voice carries and no, tom is right you? there what's up tom did you need something oh the food looks good no, from this angle Here we <laughs> he was he was uh monitoring the cat food which is nice <laughs> <laughs> most stepdad that's thing most i've ever da- heard i was gonna say my stepdad <laughs> literally monitors our cat his cat's food so that sounds about right. By the way, I'm next to the cat food, in case you didn't know. Um, but oh my my, God. my mom is working in the basement, too. So if my I know my voice carries, so I'm trying to be a little quieter. So I don't scream, what the no, fuck, while delicate. she's on the phone with a client. So. Oh, my God. That's my grown child in the background. <laughs> don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. Just my nearly 30-year-old baby. <laughs> Who works on the internet. It's, it's, don't even make me explain it. <laughs> anyway. Oh what uh how are you what's going on listen well um i have a slight update as to why i drink this week (gasps) why which is that i found out that if this baby doesn't flip itself which i realized i call it like i called it the completely wrong term i called it i forget what i called it but it's an ecv where they try to flip your baby and so you said c csv or something yes or something stupid (laughs) hey i will bring you something from cvs though if that's the case (laughs) there actually is a test a cvs test that you can do anyway whatever so either i just already foresee people being like christine wow you need to like read an article or something but um (laughs) (laughs) go to school dummy school go back to school i don't think that they're gonna offer that i don't know though but so it's like where they manually try to flip the baby Uh um but so if the baby doesn't flip i'm getting an ultra next week if the baby doesn't flip then i have to they're scheduling a c-section for 39 weeks so i have like the exact next week potential date no well when this comes out maybe i don't know no two weeks from when this comes out i think so like wow that's really soon it would be september 24th i think Okay, thank God. Like, for sure not a Scorpio, though. So, like, we're in the clear. <laughs> no, no. It would be closer to a Virgo than, than a Scorpio. Mm, I just, if the baby isn't a Gemini, do we really love it? You know? So I mean, that's the answer the... is no, but, like, <laughs> I know. that's too late for that, right? Like, at this All point, right. Maybe, maybe it'll be, like, Gemini moon, <clears throat> Gemini rising, you know? Gemini rising wouldn't be very interesting. Did you know Blaze is a Gemini rising? And that's why. I, that's I was like, not true. It is. And I was like, why on earth does a Capricorn marry me and why do i marry capricorn doesn't make any sense Hmm. he has gemini in him makes a lot of sense now very interesting (laughs) huh (laughs) anyway (laughs) so okay so the baby will be here only like a week earlier two weeks earlier yes it would be like a week before the due date but like for some reason does it still freak you out oh fully and september 24th is like less than a month from today as we're recording this which is like holy crap Huh. We better catch up on episodes. <laughs> I see where you're coming ha, ha, from ha. now. Lol, lol, lol. Um, We're going to figure it out. We, I, hmm, To everyone listening, we are going to figure it out. I don't know how, but there, you will still be getting your weekly scheduled episodes. We just don't know how because Christine won't be available. I keep being I'll like, be here, but I don't know where you'll be. M's going to be the MC, just like, so. I'm the, the MC, the M. <gasps> The MC. See, Chrissy. Oh wait, that's very cute. Uh, yeah, Either I'm gonna that down. Just kidding. I'm we gonna her out again. carry this show on my back for an entire maternity leave. I'm gonna try we to come back, and I'm gonna be like, actually, we've kind of moved on to. A I've been like, the format. demographic has changed. We've <laughs> taken some surveys. We've the taken Gen Zers just aren't into you. They They're have not a feeling beef it. with you. They're and not feel- <laughs> <laughs> they have a big beef. A big they have beef, a beef with roast. your fucking baby, actually. So. <laughs> yeah, well, so do I at this point. So it's fine. I have you ever it. seen the? Do you watch? I know you don't watch this. Um, but it's called the uh, 
the real life bros of Simi Valley. What the hell are you talking okay, about? It's so funny. So I used to work on it at ISS. <coughs> and so that's where I <coughs> sorry, I had milk. Um my, <laughs> why? My, why would you do that? Because I'm stupid. Um <laughs> It, I so I would have never heard about the show if I wasn't working on it, but I I could not. It was the funniest thing because it was literally like people from Simi Valley in California, yeah, like acting out satire of the worst tropes of people that live oh, in Simi so Valley. Oh, so it's like a satirical show. Yeah, well, it's it's supposed to be a reality show about these guys from Simi Valley, but it's these guys clearly act like over hyping like the vibe, which is like very like, you know bros i mean if you're not from there it might not make sense but just go watch it. i think it's on facebook if anyone ever wants a request it's very funny whether or not you know it the sounds area. like something i'd enjoy well they're uh one of them uh ends up getting a girl pregnant and having a baby and uh his best friend has like real beef with the baby <gasps> and like <laughs> There's times when he's like, this little this little bro's just staring at me. Yo, yo. And he's like talking to his best friend who's the dad. He's like, yo, get your boy. I'm about to get crazy with him. We're about to throw hands. <laughs> oh my God. It's like, <laughs> Hold me back. Hold me back. Hold me back. You don't even want this. You don't even want this smoke. And so uh, I think about me and your baby and I'm like, one day I'm going to be like, yo, Christine, get your baby. It's going to get crazy over here because they're not letting me share Cheerios. It's getting, I, we're, I'm losing it over here. So they tried to take your food is probably what's going to happen. And you're going to lose your mind. Oh, I'll look you in the eye and I'll be like this relationship with the baby. Sorry. Over. It's over. It's over. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, uh, how are you? You're good. I'm good. I'm, f- I, I mean, I feel like I've complained about a lot of things. More importantly, the how's hour, the cat so. food? It's, you know, we're at a steady incline. So. Oh, that's good. I, I don't know why he came down here to check when there's a whole extra bag right next to me so probably because you were screaming about cockroaches <laughs> i don't know what his deal is i do appreciate him he is quite the house dad every time i like look around and see what he's up to he's just like doing a different his his love language is acts of service and so that's he's, how my stepdad is it's so funny he's like i love oh, it i'm just <laughs> i'm just cleaning the pool i'm just cleaning the garage i'm, I'm just like sit down my guy <laughs> my stepdad will be like can i come over and i'm like okay so he has a project he wants to do he doesn't want to so i'm like sure and i'll come over and be like i want to take all these cardboard boxes to the recycling center and i'm like all right come over come hang out <laughs> i'll sit in the corner watching tiktok and you can clear out all the trash in my house I- if i ever lived closer to this house i kind of wonder and fear that tom would always be over doing something and i'd be yeah. like I don't need that, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's very helpful. And my stepdad has a very good gauge of like, I'm not just going to show up, which is nice. Um, but I just, a uh, fun fact, we have a dumpster now. Um, fun. I've never been so excited about something. You mean a permanent outdoor trash pile? Not a permanent, but semi-permanent because hmm. they're working on our garage. So with the house, we got this decrepit abandoned dentist office that's also very haunted. Yes. Um, and so <laughs> part of the thing is that we're going to try to turn it into a garage so that's been like a year and a half in the making it's like a nightmare but they're finally starting it this week on i think wednesday of this week they started it finally and they brought a massive dumpster and i'm like oh my god all of my boxes and shit that have just been piling up i can put in the dumpster and i'm so excited this is what i get excited about now as i'm 30 years old wow you're Um, a mom absolutely i just love i just love finally having somewhere to put all my trash i just have so much trash all the time I don't know how you accumulate this much I don't trash either. You know. It's bad. Like, my mom will come over and be like, again? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's because we order so much stuff. Like, we order Gio's dog food. We order the cat food. We order Daily Harvest. We order HelloFresh. Like, I feel like every week there's, like, a new box that I get, have to get rid of. I don't know. I <sighs> also my problem. As I also up. accumulate a lot of trash, but nothing like you. That's that's Olympic level. It's sad. It's it's really like I need to I need to to <laughs> stop buying better, things. <laughs> be better to the planet. I don't know. Um, <sighs> so yes, that's and I also very much insist on recycling. And then our recycling bill bin is full, and I'm like, well, gotta wait till the recycling bin <laughs> is empty, so we never catch up. You know. I hear you. Maybe get I two know. recycling bins. I tried that. They were like, you can't have that. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, I okay. can't doubly save the planet? That's no, interesting. I'm not allowed to. Anyway. <sighs> so is that why you drink? You That's got... why. Well, also because I have potential plant C-section for the 24th. So good luck. Is me. it the 24th now? Uh, or the 19th? Tw- oh, no. It's the 24th if um, it's week 39, the 24th of September. I see. 
if the baby doesn't boop, flip. <sighs> All then, right. So Good to we'll know. See. We'll see what I can pull off here. I got a yoga ball. I'll try my best. Yes. Good luck. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> my doctor's like, you. have a conversation. And I was like, I, it's not working. They don't, the baby doesn't listen to me. <laughs> anyway. Just knock on the belly and be like, get out. Get Excuse out. Excuse me. So my story is a is the part two to mm. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Um, the scandals. Yes. And last week, uh, if you want to go back and listen to that episode, it was the kind of like a quick summary, like a, like a little biography of how they came to be. Um, and this week is going to be the scandals surrounding them, which doesn't always mean that they're involved because so the Warrens, they are the inspiration for the Conjuring series. And there's also been some lawsuit issues with the Conjuring franchise, oh, which we'll okay. talk about just because I want to cover everything. I, y'all, I appreciate that everyone asked for me to cover the Warrens, but nobody really gave me like any <laughs> direction. And so some guidance and structure. Yeah. I, Cause everyone was like, just do Ed and Lorraine Warren. And I was like, do you want me to just do like their entire life? Cause if they did literally like what, it was like 10,000 10, cases or something. I was like, I, this is me telling about Ed okay, Lorraine. The also, podcast now is you me. Have an episode for the rest of time. Like we have 10,000 stories, apparently. Apparently so. <laughs> and so, um, so I didn't know what people meant by that, but then I have seen, um, online. I was unaware up until people started telling me that I guess the Warrens are really problematic and I did not know that. Um, oh. Yes, because I've seen people write in being like, why do you support the Warrens? And I was like, first of all, I don't think I ever said I support the Warrens. I, I don't just, think so either. I just <laughs> like that they're like, how cool is it to be a main character in all these ghost stories? Like, that's all. They just but seem apparently, like, like they're characters. Yeah, it just seems like they're always there. But anyway, people took that as me like siding with them as if, as if I knew what the other oh, information no. was. So I, I'm just covering everything because I don't know what the fuck people are hoping for. And I just want to just make sure I, you know, give them what they want. Yeah. So, and, and if I, if I miss something for the people who seem to know more about this before I did, um, like, and that's not, you know, me trying to be, if you genuinely know more about this than I do, please write in if I missed something. Cause I tried and I don't feel like there was actually like a, like any one large specific crisis. Mm. Um, I saw, I found like two, like one is just like the people being skeptical of them, but or like that they are potentially grifters. But there was never like a solid issue. Like and a then, main storyline. Yeah, and then and then one comes out because of the lawsuits with the Conjuring universe. So oh, okay. But other than that, I don't know what people were looking for. So let me know. Um. <clears throat> okay. So let's start with their the skepticism people had around the legitimacy of their work slash the chance that they were potentially grifting and just doing all this for money and fame and they weren't actually valid and what they right. were doing. So um, there's a lot of skepticism about the Warrens and the legitimacy of their cases and the main concern was that no one ever saw any hard evidence of a haunting that couldn't be refuted or have an, an easy excuse. Oh. So people even started doubting Lorraine's gifts and like I said in the last episode she got tested to prove that her gifts are actually far above average so that was her way of kind of shutting people up and making herself feel valid but apparently the ridicule really ate her up um, oh no of people judging her so only she truly knows if her gifts were legit or not but I would say at least one person in those 10,000 cases thinks that Lorraine really saved their life so um you know, run with that how you will. Yeah. Um, some say that they might have actually just made up each of the cases uh, for, or like they would have made up whatever proof that they claimed they found purely for clout. So like if they said, oh, we got this audio or we got this, these pictures, basically it's like today's version of Ghost Adventures. Like, okay, you technically got evidence, but like it could all more or less be excused if you're mm-hmm. not a believer. It's easy to say like, oh, the picture was doctored or... Right, oh, this audio wasn't legit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and I did mention this last time too, that they were devout Catholics. Mm-hmm. And um, Ed, 
happily admitted that he would do things for clout and money if it meant that their fame would rise so people would pay attention to them so that he could have a larger audience to expose the devil to. Uh And a lot of people could see that as like, okay, he's a devout Catholic and doing what he needs to to fight for God or something. Right. But other people could also say, like, he literally admitted he's a clout chaser. Right. Like, he wants an audience. Yeah. yeah. And he's, like, hiding behind the fact that he's Catholic to, like, make it seem valid or something. Right. One of the issues that people take with him and their their intense Catholicism and then, like, using this as, like, a don't get into the occult, they just happened to be really big during the 70s and the 80s, which was during the Satanic Panic. And so... Mm-hmm. It's almost like they put themselves in the front lines of being the prime leaders before there were any other famous experts to rely on about this. So whatever they said went, especially when there was a bunch of parents fearing for their kids that they were like going to get into the occult and shit. So, you know, parents were making their kids go to these lectures. Colleges were worried about their students. It would make them go to lectures. It was like a huge college circuit that they ran. That's crazy. Because there was this fear that the teens are going to get into witchcraft. So, by the way, also in 2021, it's, like, not a cute look that they were using this propaganda to, like, make people afraid of witches. Let's put it that way. Let's do that also. I mean, it's all very bizarre and, like, it's questionable. (laughs) He, they also, um, it was a really, uh, I always say really intelligent or ingenious idea of, like, this is a really spooky thing that people want to hear about, but also parents see us as protecting their kids. And so, I mean, it was like the perfect storm to have people selling out your lecture halls because people want to go see a bunch of scary pictures and hear ghost stories and get creeped out. And, but at the same time, you're teaching them a lesson. So it was right. like, a, it was a very perfect storm for them to always, um, like if that be was a hot class ticket. credit, I'd be like, sure, I'll go. <laughs> exactly. So it was it was very easy for them to make their money by saying like, we've done really scary stuff. Come to our lecture and find out. And so even though they find were out never how dangerous it is, yeah, <laughs> bingo. So yeah. even if they were never actually making any money off of their investigations, um, they were still making money off of people wanting to hear about the investigations. Right. And it gives people even more reason to say like they never needed money for the investigation because they knew that they were going into an empty house without ghosts and there was nothing to find and they didn't mm-hmm. even want to get charged to just like stand in a room that they knew wasn't threatening. They just wanted the money later to talk right. about how scary it was. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, plus on top of their lecture circuit and their speaking engagements, they also made, uh, I'm sure they made a bunch of money from like selling their rights to like the Amityville story and things like that, which sold like crazy. So just having their name attached to it, you know, made them super big. They were doing, um, press junkets. They were on TV shows. I mentioned a lot of this last time, but I just want to go over it again that like they were getting a lot of media appearances and all of them they were getting paid for Uh um a lot of times they would uh claim that hauntings only came from engaging in occult activity or sinning in some way they were very conservative yeah so apparently i didn't read the book so i could be totally wrong but the sources i was reading (laughs) it looks like they read the book they were saying the the, (laughs) i I know someone read the book (laughs) so it's called the demonologist i mention it a little bit later actually Um, but it's from 1980. It's the demonologist. And, uh, I guess it really shows how, um, stern or how strict in their religion that they were, uh, that the Warrens were, but it seems that they would say basically any version of you sinning, you're just opening a portal to the devil. Like it, like they were like really strict straight out of the forties you know, good Christian people. Wow, I must be sucked into some wormhole then, (laughs) because... I know. (laughs) So some say that they may have actually... I don't know if this is true or not, but there is the rumor that they might have actually turned families away who weren't religious because they were less likely to fall for any hauntings that they might Uh have been trying to uh, convince you of. Um, I don't think that's true if they're doing 10,000 cases in 20 years. It's hard to find 10,000 strict Catholics, I would say, (laughs) but I mean, what do I know? But skeptics will probably say, like, oh, and they found people who were the most vulnerable to believe them, you know? Sure, sure. So, uh, and also, it was a little skeevy to people that they were also bringing in their own film crews for, like, local news affiliates and things like that. I've heard about that. So, like, in Amityville, they brought their own little film crew. Okay. Um, 
and that picture of the ghost boy by the stairs that is like super freaky it like looks like a real alive human child um people are like that literally could have just been a human child i mean everyone in the amityville story says there was nobody in the house there were no children in the house do i know that story that picture i must I, if it- you if you saw it you would know it here amityville sorry boy picture um it's so the story goes that they lorraine felt something by the stairs and took a picture and okay and uh there's a very creepy picture of a little boy leaning over the stair re- stairwell oh wait i do remember this did you talk and about this in a- in the amityville episode maybe i'm gonna send you the picture okay um but the i do feel like apparently I the this. boy looks like one of the DeFeo children who was oh, murdered. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, my God, yes. We literally have this on our Instagram from way back when. From way we back should, when. We should repost it. We'll repost it. But, yeah, uh, okay, I see where you could be, like, I mean, it literally looks like a child, like a human I mean, child. yeah, if you, if you believe in the Warrens and what they're doing, and you also just read the Amityville books, you just saw the Amityville movie, you know that they're right. attached, and, like, everyone is saying that this picture is legitimate, uh, you know, it would be really cool if it was legitimate. It'd be really scary if it was legitimate. Yeah. But realistically, a skeptic <laughs> could be like, they literally just took a picture of a fucking kid. Like, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> so, I don't know. There's, it's, like, that picture, I don't it's know if scary. they ever, like, sold it for any money or anything. But the fact that they even had the local news come, it's it's almost like they're doing all of this really um, elaborate stuff just to really blow your mind so that mm-hmm. they're... I don't know. So their lecture tickets cost more next time or something. I mean, a lot of people think that every step was a planned grifting tactic. Okay. If your mind blow, if your mind is blown here, just wait to see this picture later. And what if you see this later and this later? Sure. So it was all building up on their fame. Okay. Um, I feel like a lot of this is repetitive, but I'm just saying as much as I can. Makes sense. Like that's the critique. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all this is just sounds like you know swindling yeah it's um, like any sort of skeptic of a ghost hunter medium anything like that i think it's similar exactly i would love vibe. to see a world where harry houdini was alive with, yes, at the same time as the warrens point. because they might have been real opposites you know he would have found a way into and one of their and, investigations and zb i feel like that would have been quite oh my god a daytime talk show situation you know zach would have harry houdini on the show just to blow his fucking mind a hundred percent a hundred percent um okay so uh oh plus there's this weird information i got this from a youtube channel what was the youtube video called this was the only place i saw this information but um it was called possessed by horror ed and lorraine warren were liars question (laughs) question mark and it was kind of a compilation of different cases they've done that felt a little shady but apparently during the amityville case um information came out later that um so for those of you who don't know about the story about the amityville horror is that this house in new york the defeo family lived there and their oldest son claims he was possessed by the devil and murdered his entire family and that was Um, episode five correct four Four, episode four. four four And I will do a, a retelling of that because oh, I'm sure my wait. information will be a little crisper next time. Um, but so he killed his whole family and then only a, a very short turnaround later, the Lutz family moved in because it was cheap and they claim to have been haunted by mm-hmm. either the children from the, the family that died before them or the same demon that was possessing Ronald right. DeFeo and they only lived in that house for 28 days and when af- on the by the 28th day it was so horrible that they literally left the house in the middle of the night and never came back for their belongings so and this house is in New York Amityville New York yeah Amityville New York um so there apparently was some information that came out and this could have totally been someone making this up to make the Warrens look bad but the information's there that the DeFeo's lawyer when Ronald DeFeo was put on trial for murdering his family, his lawyer at one point formed an alliance with the Lutz family who moved in after the deaths. Oh. Apparently that lawyer heard that the Lutzes were moving into the house and like hung out with them uh, to make that, to like almost get a story together. Apparently they had like a 
creative writing session of sorts, quote <laughs> okay. unquote, um, where basically they wanted to figure out a, a a horrific tale about what the Lutzes are going through it, it, as a way to get basically a testimony proving that Ronald DeFeo was in fact haunted by something demonic. Okay. Does that make sense? Sort of. Sorry. I think I'm just So slow. Ronald DeFeo, who killed his family, his right. lawyer found out that oh, the new f- lawyer Got yeah it. he okay. that lawyer started talking to the Lutz family who moved in after the murders right um and he was i i uh, guess they were huh. trying to build a case together or he they made some sort of agreement where the Lutzes were talking about how scary that house was because it was clearly haunted and the lawyer wanted to use that story to defend his clients this is like his defense attorney who's was like, like oh, i'm talking to, to the new family the and they are also uh. saying this place is super haunted and therefore ronald defeto wasn't actually a murderer he was in fact possessed by the devil and you can plead I insanity see okay that makes total sense yes and there was even discussion that maybe ronald defeo's um lawyer hired the warrens to be a part of the investigation because they seemed really credible and maybe if the warrens were doing an investigation at the house that someone just was possessed by the devil at yeah then maybe the warrens would be able to find something and they could say no no like this guy can plead insanity to murdering his family because we'll vouch for it we found shit there too Uh so it's all alleged right alleged okay um, but it, the information exists out in yeah. the world that apparently this is one theory that okay. happened. Okay. Um, and so, anyway, so maybe the the Warrens and the Lutz the Lutz family who did know each other, by the way, the Warrens and the Lutz family did know each other oh. because the Warrens did come to investigate the house after everything was right. going on with the Lutz. So, um, because they knew of each other. There's some rumors that they work together. Also, right. this same story has been spun into a separate theory when people don't believe the Lutz family that the house was haunted. And they say, well, you brought in the Warrens so that way they could confirm it was haunted and you could make a bunch of money. The Amityville horror story, actually, um, there's a lot of its own individual scandal because I, if I ever do the Amityville horror again, I'm definitely going to cover the the potential grifting part mm. of that because the entire family uh i think went into hiding at one point because like they just got completely reamed by yeah the public of like you did all of this for money you ended up on talk shows you had the warrens come so i'm sure this story of the defeo lawyer working with the lutzes and warrens could also be spun into this is how the lutzes got popular right Anyway, it's a whole thing that they maybe all were working together to help Ronald DeFeo seem like he didn't kill his family. Mm -hmm. Um, Meanwhile, another way that uh, the Warren's credibility has been judged is that the Annabelle doll, if we Mm -hmm. remember the Annabelle doll, Mm -hmm. that was episode 10 of And That's Why We Drink, (laughs) Um, which, again, I, I say all these as if, I mean, they're all very old episodes, so I would like to co- revise each of them. But for now, we've got episode 10 of Annabelle. And uh, apparently, so for those of you who don't know, the Annabelle doll actually lives inside Ed and, Ed and Lorraine's um, occult museum. Right. So after everything Which is that like happened. their house, right? It's like, it's attached to their house. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and they would pay people to, if they wanted to come to the museum and see everything. Again, or they would charge people. They would charge people. Oh, yes. Sorry. Not pay people. <laughs> um, they would charge people, which is another thing of like, oh, you're charging admission sure. for like the world's scariest items that could hurt people. Why are you letting people go into the house? You know, like, why well, are you? I don't know. You're suckers for that, too. So <laughs> I know. I, I don't really blame them for that. I think it's a genius move. Zach Bagans copied them. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, they have the Annabelle doll behind glass with like a giant sign on her that says like, don't touch or don't let out of don't, don't let, let out, out of her cage, cage. Oh my if, god. if you if you get her out of the cage she'll like kill people again i'm not totally oh sure oh my god but um apparently ed used to tell people who came to visit annabelle that the last person to make fun of the annabelle doll tragically died but there's no proof of that never oh. got, gave any names never gave any evidence so a lot of people say okay you're just making this even scarier than it needs to be 
Plus, apparently, the show The Twilight Zone in oh, my 1963, show. they have an episode about an evil doll, and mm-hmm. one of the main characters in that episode was named Annabelle. So oh. a lot of people think, like, maybe he took inspiration from that episode and just hoped no one would put it together, and this is <laughs> just, like, a, he, he just made this doll evil. I don't know. It's it's a, a weird coincidence Coincidence, i guess yeah yeah so people like to use that against them plus the fact that annabelle now sits behind glass um at their museum and again people pay to see her if some people are upset that it feels exploitative sure um and then there's the case that i covered a while ago i think it was episode two thirteen oh i was like two no, no. <laughs> I think it was episode 213. I forgot to write it down. But the uh, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson case of The Devil Made Me Do It. Oh, yep, yep, yep. So, which, by the way, was inspiration for The Conjuring 3. Okay. Um, so, uh, in 2007, the boy who was possessed that uh, the Warrens did an exorcism on, his older brother claims that there was never any hauntings, and the Warrens made up this entire story um, mm. just for... I don't know. I guess money. That's not a good look. So uh, there was a uh, there was an author who I'm going to you're going to learn his name a lot by the end of this. His name is Gerald Brittle. OK. And Gerald, Gerald Brittle, uh, in this case, at least with the Arnie Shane Johnson, he wrote this book called The Devil in Connecticut mm. about about the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently Lorraine also co-wrote it. So they think like, oh, well, Lorraine could have had some artistic license and you know written in scarier parts that right. than what really existed um the older brother to the kid who was possessed who says that there were no hauntings in fact he uh tried to sue for unspecified damages and exploitation oh boy he has a quote saying lorraine warren is nothing but a fraud she <gasps> says she has documentation but she has nothing um and he basically says that the entire case wow. just destroyed their family, and that's not good. Meanwhile, that's a bad look. In a, in a more relevant uh, twist of events, Zach Bagans has bought the chair that the little boy was exercised in. <laughs> Fun. The chair. <clears throat> um, and people who sit in it at the haunted museum apparently like ends up having to go get like corrective back surgery because okay, like okay that seems really don't let people sit in that. So if you'd like to be more attached to this case, you can go watch Conjuring 3 and then go sit in a chair at Don't Zach's house. Don't sit in that chair, man. I'm telling you. Apparently when he brought that chair in, like within like three hours of them opening the exhibit, they had to cancel it. They had to like, they had to take it down and like shut it down. Mm. And so they revised the exhibit because people like were leaving ill and passing out and shit. Oh so my God. Anyway, uh, another one is the Snedeker case which oh yeah i think i i'm you pretty did. sure i covered them yeah you did um and lorraine warren uh so the snedeker case was also the inspiration for the movie a haunting in connecticut okay yep um and lorraine warren actually says that she was embarrassed by the inaccuracies in this movie fun fact lorraine says that lorraine says it. she saw the movie and she went none of that was fucking true oh wow okay and she says this is a quote from her. Do you know the amount of time and effort we ha- put into that case? Do you know how many meetings with the clergy we had to finally bring closure to that family? And apparently Oof. the book, the movie does not show that. So um, interesting, though, that the person being accused of for yeah. like being fake is the one saying like none of that movie was accurate. But do <laughs> so. you think it's because she was like, <laughs> oh, they didn't show all the work I put into it? It sounded like she was like, do you know how much... <laughs> I don't. I haven't seen the movie in so long. I wouldn't know what she means by that. Okay. But I. I. To be fair, I think in a haunting in Connecticut. I don't know if the. I don't think that the Warrens were actually in that movie. So. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, is she like, oh, they didn't even show all the work I did on that mm, case? Do you know what I'm saying? I see. Like it was inaccurate because it didn't portray her and all her hard work. Interesting. I don't like, know. She said, "Oh, all the." Um, me- do you know how many meetings I had to have with the clergy to close? Right, right. I feel like I don't it's know. That's a good. That's a good point. Self focused. <laughs> anyway, so there's uh, there's the movie Haunting in Connecticut where you can learn about the Snedeker case, um, and that one didn't actually have people portraying the Warrens. And then the Conjuring universe, it 
it does have the one. And she's like, portrayed. that one's accurate. <laughs> and she's like, actually, she did say The Conjuring was the most accurate well, movie. Well, there you go. <laughs> that, okay, that's not good luck. I but, don't know. <laughs> so uh, the, there's a book about the Snedeker case, just like how there was a book about the Arnie Shane Johnson case. Mm-hmm. There was a book called In a Dark Place, The Story of a True Haunting. Ooh. And I'm sure that also, I'm sure between the Snedeker case and real life and this book, that was the inspiration for A Haunting in Connecticut. Right. Um, but so this book was written by the Warrens, as well as a few other people, one of them being one of the Snedekers, and one of them being Ray Garten. And Ray Garten is actually a horror author. And so people are like, why did you need a horror author to write a case that should have already been scary on point. its own. You know what I mean? Yep, I do. If it's already a scary story that re- that's like good enough for a book, why do you need a documentation, not like uh-huh. <laughs> fictional. Although yeah. some people who are pro warn will say, well, they just wanted someone who knew how to write scary to like really that like make sure too. that the message got across, and you know they wanted like someone who is better at writing and giving you the creeps to like go in with our actual real information and just like make it more deliver powerful. it a certain way yeah i mean that makes sense too i totally get that but yeah. there is also the argument of like okay but like why was why was someone else needed to tell your yeah. story blah, blah 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 so one thing that is odd though is that ray garden to write to help with his piece he wanted to get interviews of everybody in the family about their experience during this haunting okay um, I guess he just wanted to like get quotes from them. So while he was helping them judge the story up, he would get he would have real quotes. Sure. But when he was interviewing the family for the book, he saw that there was a lot of inconsistencies and the storylines didn't line up. Ruh-roh. And he went to Ed uh, saying, like, what do I do about this? Like, it doesn't sound like any of this is <laughs> making sense. It's not the same story every time. And Ed apparently said, quote, don't worry, they're crazy. You've got some <gasps> of the story. Just use what works and make the rest up. Just make it up and make it scary. <gasps> That's, That's not, not good. good. Not a good look. Buddy. Not a good look. Not a good look. Why would um, you even say that? What are you thinking? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. So, um they're that's, crazy that's really nice well oh so God. apparently there this snedeker family also was a family that was dealing with some substance abuse and oh, so shit. now there's the idea that maybe there never was any hauntings and people were just having you know they were delusional or i don't know if that's even the right word to say but they were seeing things and nothing yeah, was actually like having really hallucinations there. or something yeah so there's we don't know we don't know. Then it's um, extra bad to call them quote unquote crazy. Crazy. Yikes. Yep. Um, there's another case which I've never heard Not of good. and now plan to cover called Bill Ramsey the Wolfman. And uh, Wait. <laughs> apparently the Warrens took on this case of a guy that literally was maybe a werewolf. And so um, <laughs> Lorraine claims that he, she actually has a video of Ramsey transforming into a wolf. Okay. But then it's never been seen. Yeah, I was going to say, well, where is it? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Plus, uh, in the book they wrote about that case, there is allegedly no actual evidence of him being a wolf man. It was just a book about the case, but no, like, hard-hitting facts that would have really freaked you out. Okay. In 1990... Uh, Ed claimed that he got footage of the White Lady of Union Cemetery. Apparently, this is like oh. a big Connecticut case, um, yeah. or a big, a, a famous ghost in Connecticut, um, the White Lady of Union Cemetery, and he okay. claims he got footage, but no footage has ever really been seen. And <sighs> also, one person has come forward who has said that the footage does exist, but it is literally of them under a bed sheet. Oh, come on. And maybe even Ed him. He's like, I got footage. And then he like looked at it again and was like, oh, this actually isn't very convincing. Yeah. He was probably like, it's not actually, we should just not even show anyone. It's too late. We already told everyone we have it. Oops. (laughs) So there's that. Um, Then the Enfield poltergeist, which I have covered. I remember that too. Um, The Enfield poltergeist was the inspiration for The Conjuring 2. Oh my goodness. Just let me run a list down because I feel like I might be confusing people. So in the conjuring universe if you're trying to watch a movie and you want to see your favorite case represented in in these movies a haunting in connecticut was the snedeker case 
Conjuring 1 was about the Perrin family and their haunting. Conjuring 2 was uh, the Enfield poltergeist. And the Conjuring 3, which only came out uh, like last year or earlier this year, is uh, Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, The Devil Made Me Do It. Okay. And then there's also a whole trilogy about Annabelle. Okay. Okay. As well. And those are all in the same bubble. Those are all in the same bubble. Those okay. are all f- filmed by I didn't the, realize that. the same production company. Um, there's also La Llorona and The Nun, but I don't think either of those have anything to do with the universe itself. So, Well, are they like somehow... <clears throat> They're still still connected and uh, like directed by the same people. Oh, and all that. got it's, it. Same team. It's or the same like production company. I think oh, okay. that I makes you. all these movies and the same director. But um, if you're looking for one specifically portraying the Warrens, that's the Conjuring series. So one, two, three. Okay. It's a it's a little bit of a mess. Sorry, everyone. No, but, no, it's good to know. I didn't realize all that. So because I keep saying like, oh, this one inspired this one. So just wanted to give everyone. I didn't a realize how broad study list. this whole fucking series is. I know it's pretty. Cr- I mean, it's also pretty genius. Like, hey, with all like here's Ed and Lorraine Warren. They've done 10,000 cases. Let's make a whole universe of movies. About I mean, it. seriously. I mean, and they're all going to have some connection and we can keep building on it. Yes. Yeah, genius. Um, so the Enfield Poltergeist, which was The Conjuring 2. Mm -hmm. Apparently, a lot of activity happened away from investigators, but Uh, it was implied that the investigators were like, it's implied that not only Ed and Lorraine, but all investigators were present for a lot of the creepy stuff. But realistically, it was a lot of after, a lot of hearsay afterwards from the kids. So the Enfield poltergeist was there was four siblings and one of them was slowly becoming possessed. (sighs) by a poltergeist in the house and it was just like a really gnarly haunting but I remember it. <clears throat> so it was like two two of the daughters were sleeping in the same room and so it was a lot of times it was like two of the kids pretending to make sounds or pretending to do something and then they even admitted later like they made some of the stuff up because they were trying to freak out the investigators um so even though the conjuring 2 makes it look like the warrens were majorly involved in this investigation apparently they only showed up for one day at the Enfield house, uninvited, and then kind of got asked to leave. Oh. Which is interesting. And not for anything, not for, like, any, like, wrong reasoning. Not like they, like, did something bad and had to leave the house. But, like, they, like, they just weren't even invited to be there. And they just showed up. Oh. So I'm wondering if out of their 10,000 cases, I'm wondering if, like, how many of them were they asked to go to? And how many of them were, like, we're the Warrens and we'll just show up and they'll be grateful we're there? They just inserted or, themselves. Or how many of those were, like, if, if you listen to the first episode of this little two-parter, um, they used to, like, approach people's houses right. and, like, make art of the house and say, like, we want to give this to you in exchange for, like, ghost stories. Like, how many times were they just kind of inserting themselves into a narrative and calling it a case, you know? Right. No, completely. Because, I mean, 10,000 is bananas. And, like, and, like, from the 50s to the how do you maybe even track 90s. That? I don't know. I don't know how you track that. Yeah. And also, like, I don't know. Like, maybe they... I don't, I don't know the reasoning. I don't want to... It doesn't sound like they were necessarily doing anything wrong. I feel like if I were known as a massive paranormal investigator and there was a huge poltergeist crisis, I would maybe want to check it out. Like, I, like I'm like i not saying they did anything, like, super duper wrong, but also, like, no one asked them to be there. Like, they didn't have to be That's there. That's bullshit. M would be hiding under a blanket and be like, don't get me near that poltergeist. <laughs> I also would have pulled a warrants and left after one day. To yeah, be you fair. would have been like, I'm <laughs> uninviting myself from this. Yeah, it's like, I was not invited, and now I am really, un- not even I want to be invited here. So, um, so anyway, it was interesting. When you watch The Conjuring 2, it seems like it was one of the Warren's biggest cases, but there were like other people involved in the Enfield poltergeist, actually the SPR, the society of psychical oh. research. They were the ones leading an investigation and like, they already had to deal with Harry Houdini showing up every now and then. Now they're like <laughs> these fucking guys. So um, it's, it's interesting. The SPR, there's actually a, a one member from the SPR who was one of the head investigators of the Enfield poltergeist who ended up saying a lot about the, uh, Warrens and okay. when he saw them there. So his name was Guy Playfair. Wow, what a name. I know. Um, and he said that uh, <clears throat> he remembers bumping into them at the Enfield Poltergeist house and he was not impressed. Oh, um, This is a quote from him. Let me um, lubricate. <laughs> <sighs> 
I could feel I was getting a little parched there. <clears throat> Guy said, quote, they did turn up once, I think at Enfield, and all I can remember is Ed Warren telling me that he could make a lot of money for me out of it. Ooh. So I thought, well, that's all I need to know from you, and I got myself out of his way as soon as I could. They just wanted to make money out of it. Ed, like, co- you're uh, cool. It, your 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 quotes are being requoted. And Stop like, it. If, and it's like if he if his argument is like, wow, this is gonna make us a lot of money because we're gonna be put on the spotlight and we will be exposing people to the devil, like. Like he's not framing it like, uh, if this guy is right, I'm uh, I'm assuming sure. that his opinion is is solid and true here. I I would if I were Ed, I would have not said like, wow, we're gonna make a lot of money. I would have been like, wow, a lot of people are gonna learn about the devil, and <laughs> a lot of people are gonna find Jesus. You know, we're like it would expose <laughs> a lot of people are about to be saved. You know, like yes, something we're, something we're like helping, that. We're helping the world. We're doing right. a service. Yeah. Service. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it, according to this guy, Ed just was in it for the money. Um, well, and to tell the other guy, I mean, I do get why if, if Ed were really. Especially a guy he didn't know, you just met him that day. Yeah, but like, I get why if you were really in it for the money, you'd probably be like, well, I'm sure other people are too. Right. Like, I feel like if, if that is your headspace, like, oh, I'm doing this for, for mo- monetary gain, you look at another guy there and you're like, hey, like, let me in on this. Right. Can help us get a shit ton of money. <laughs> right. Wrong guy. You're talking to the wrong Meanwhile, guy. Meanwhile, though, in other quotes, like the documentary I watched about this, every single one of their quotes is like really wholesome and pure wow. and genuine of like, we just want to help people. Like we've he always been fascinated. wasn't careful with these quotes. It seems wishy-washy. It seems like we're, it seems like maybe he had a lot of opinions and every person is cherry picking the personality trait of his that they want. Yeah. Like, yeah. it seems like he, I mean, I don't. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm not trying to sound like I'm defending them. I'm just trying, this is one of the first times where I'm not one of the first times, but this is one of the few times where I have to do your job where like, there are people still alive that could be like upset by what I'm saying just and all this. And I, I don't, allegedly. I just, yeah, I just, I don't want to offend anybody because I don't know what's true and what's not. So I just feel like I have to keep playing the yeah. balance game. No, that's an important but, caveat. Like we're just playing around theories. It's, it's. All I don't alleged. I don't know. All I know is they were going into a lot of haunted houses and out of 10,000, maybe some of them really were fucking haunted and maybe some of them weren't. And, and they you know, were you like, you know say, what, at least I'll make money off of this. I was going to say, like, you could say I'm going to make money off this and have it still be haunted. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean you're making it all up. It's I mean, like, I would love you to go capitalize on it, even if it's real. That's what I was going to say. Like, look yeah. at Zach Bagans. Like, he genuinely yes, exactly. wants to go into haunted houses, but he also genuinely wants to make some fucking money. I mean, like, we're so, doing that, right? Like, we're telling I'm stories. telling ghost stories yeah. and I'm making money. And like, that, it's great to have both. Wait, you're I, making I, money from this? I, a little bit. Oh, a little shit. bit. I hey, am. But you know what? I'm Venmo but it's, me. <laughs> I'll give you one penny. Um, okay. But no, like, it's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an interest in, you, in a job that you love doing, and yes. jobs come with getting paid. There's so. like a fine line there because it's sort of like people in the creative field, for example, like some people get shit for. Yeah charging for their creative services it's like but you're they're doing work they're so right. I, I get the line there yeah i get it but i do think it's interesting that he mm. a person he had never met who it's was like the look. head investigator and now no. he's saying wow we're gonna make a lot of money it's That's like bad of all the people like you're gonna go up to the head person oh, and say we're gonna make smooth. a lot of money you're, like at least go to like the like the poor guy who's just carrying batteries around or something, you know, uh, like get like the one guy who doesn't care about the ghost and is here for the money. Talk right. to him. Like, he's here for a job. No, that's a really good point. Yeah. You're like don't go to the one person who is arguably the most passionate in the room. Oof. And anyway, it was a bad look. It so was. um apparently with the parent family haunting, which was uh it, it inspired conjuring one. It's one of the, I will say, uh, it was one of the most backed up cases in the Warrens case log, where even the parents of this, the parents family does say to this day, it was an extreme haunting. Um, one of the, uh, I think, I don't know how many of them are still alive, but at least the oldest sister of the Perrin family has said a lot about it. And she said that things were haunted. Um, and so uh, the Perrin family, their current owner, though, did sue or no not uh sorry not the parent family themselves they they moved out of the house that right was haunted and the current owner has sued warner brothers though because fans were trespassing so often to get pictures oh, of the house that's not good 
Um, apparently it was really bad. Like people were publishing info about the family. Oh my and God. Some people like in the comments, like jokingly were like, haha, it'd be fun to break in there. What, and, is, like, what is wrong with people? I know. So this is my PSA. If you are someone who thinks it's funny to say, it'd be fun to break into a house and like someone lives there. Like, don't do it. Listen don't to do my it. half of the show and then realize how unfunny that is. <laughs> this, this, this is my PSA. Do not break into this person's house and leave them alone. You have your AirPods in. We're talking to you right now and you're halfway up a fence. Yep. Turn around. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. You get it. You get it. Go to Waffle uh, House. Just even relax. if you could, even if it's in your eye line, you can see it. You're so close. Just don't. Just get off the fence. Don't. It's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late. So um, the owner did say that. Uh, so the original parents who lived there, the older sister, I think her name was Andrea. She was saying like, oh yeah, th- like this place was haunted. There was definitely some creepy stuff going on. Not all of the movie itself was totally true, but I also would say like most movies aren't 100 percent accurate right, on a right. inspired story especially if they're not documentaries <clears throat> right right um and but the current owner wanted to make it very clear that like some of the more intense parts of the movie are not true so that uh in this movie there's a witch i think her name was not bethesda that's maryland Bethesda? Bethesda? No, this one's Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Oh, Bathsheba. Yeah. That's is a, that a name? Yeah. That's yep. a name? Okay. I uh, That's like a name you've heard it's of. It's from I, the Bible, I think. Wow. Here I am with my Bible and full of, my brain full of knowledge about the Bible. I've uh, never M heard of that name. literally has a Bible underneath their microphone right now. Fun fact. <sighs> my mom married a, a Catholic man. So we do, <laughs> we do have Bibles in this house now. Um, um, Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah. Uh, Uriah. In the Hebrew, but, yep. I am learning a lot of names today. Okay, Bathsheba. <laughs> so uh, the current She's owner the said of Solomon. Okay, sorry. I do know Solomon. That's a fun one. Okay, <laughs> you do know Solomon. Good. So uh, the 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 current owner said that some of the information in the movie is not true. One of it being that there was a witch named Bathsheba Sherman, um, but. In real life, that person did exist at the house, but she was not a witch and she did not die the same way, which was much more tragic in the movie. Oh. Um, they also said that there was never any satanic worship or on the property. There's never been any deaths on the property. Um, so, like, I get why you would want to clarify that if you lived there and you were like... Especially when people are like, let's break in because yeah. it's a haunted house. Like, and Don't I come think, into my basement. There's no satanic shit going on here, please. Yeah, she wants to like lay down the law of like, yeah. my house is just a house with a family in it. Leave us the fuck alone. I get that. Um, if you do want more information, like more uh, info, info on like the true debunked story of Bathsheba Sherman, um, there is a blog spot page that has all like so much information someone like really researched bathsheba um it is dreaming casually poetry.blogspot.com also i love that (laughs) i'm like bathsheba's from the bible and it's like bathsheba sherman (laughs) (laughs) the least biblical last name is that jesus's last name wait a minute (laughs) might be king Um, solomon sherman i didn't know that anyway anyway so they uh if you want to learn more about the true story or like how a the the movie version versus the real version. You can go there. There's a lot of information. So um, that being said, in terms of the nuts and bolts of it, Lorraine says that the conjuring one was actually an excellent imp- interpretation of the investigative part of the story. Okay. And then the older sister, uh, it, what's interesting is that, so I, I've been saying this whole time that she also agreed that the place was extremely haunted um, and like this stuff was definitely going on there, but in terms of the movie, she disagrees with Lorraine and that it was an accurate interpretation. She actually says, quote, it was so distant that it might as well be two stories with the characters just sharing the same names. Wow. Wait, so who, uh, this is the sister. Yeah. So, okay. um, in the parent family, they all include in the, in the Warrens, they all agree that something really fucking spooky was going on there. But in terms of the movie, Lorraine says it was accurate and the parents say it wasn't. I'm not gonna lie. I kind of am inclined to believe the family that lived it, but I, yep, I, you know, especially uh, if they're saying it was haunted, it just wasn't like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know, but I think, and maybe they, because she was a kid at the time, um, mm. and so maybe she just didn't see. I think in the movie, or maybe in real life, I, I have not researched the story 
in a long time, but I would imagine if children were involved, the Warrens had them like leave and go to grandma's for a while when they were doing like real intense so. investigations. <laughs> so maybe Lorraine is saying like, in terms of the investigation, That's this true. movie was super accurate. And the kid who wasn't there because she was taken out of the situation. She was at grandma's know. pool. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I, I, or yeah. maybe like we should believe the family or maybe we should believe the Warrens. I don't know. But just giving you every potential. Interesting. Um, fun fact, though, about the Conjuring movie, uh, about the parents' story, that movie, which none of the movies portraying the Warrens, Ed Warren ever saw. He passed away before the movies were made. Oh, wow. But, but the film that he always said would make a great movie was what became the Conjuring. Ah, uh, well, he called it. <laughs> and so even before the movie existed for him to give an opinion on it, he always did say that the parent family haunting would be, of all their cases, the one that should be a movie. So wow. it must have been really freaky in real life for him t- in some way to think, oh, like, completely. that's the one. Um, So fun fact, he kind of just, like, manifested that one day it'd be a movie, and it was the first Conjuring movie. And so. it's been a big hit, huh? Like, didn't yeah. you say the series is almost as big as king kong or something it's the it's the second largest horror franchise other than godzilla godzilla okay close which has been around longer so i'm just gonna give them like seniority on hundred years or something (laughs) so uh just like how they run the new england society of psychical research there Mm -hmm. is a new england skeptical society they're oh, arch, that's fun. They're arch rivals. Which, by the way, sounds, it's like spelled out like Nessie almost. Like, oh, I feel like that's, that's fun. That's a fun little twist. I love that. Well, Ness, but close enough. A little Ness. And so uh, the president of the New England Skeptical Society named Stephen Novella says that the Warrens never seem to ever have any evidence that would stand up to rigorous scientific testing and most of it not even to cursory testing. Oh, that's not So <laughs> Stephen is their nightmare i think um steven's a hater (laughs) they think steven is like such a hater um and he also says quote despite ed's insistence that he's engaged in scientific research he continues to jealously hoard his alleged evidence rather than allow it to be critically analyzed and it is necessary in genuine scientific endeavors as it is necessary in genuine scientific endeavors yeah i mean if he's saying i have evidence of this ghost and then they're like okay let's see it and he's like no thanks yeah (laughs) or like even and i do think that's fishy but i also think like maybe he got again i'm just trying to do the balance act here folks yeah 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 yeah, but uh you know maybe after he showed like the amityville picture which should have been like in his mind like hard-hitting evidence and everyone just shat all over it like which like people had the right to shit all over it like it looks like they literally just had a little boy in the house um but maybe he was like now i'm protective of my footage i don't want people just trashing my hard work you know totally get that too of like i guess then i i would be like don't announce that you have all this great yeah in that case like (laughs) Like, just say you don't have evidence i guess or just like keep it on the dl because i feel like it's kind of a weird look to say oh look i have all this evidence but you can't see it just trust me (laughs) exactly so one of the reasons i don't want the one of the reasons i'm being so careful with the balancing act is because the warren's only daughter judy is still alive with us and she seems like such a peach um and i i don't want to you know say no no i don't want to poo poo on her parents who aren't even alive to defend themselves no no um and so uh, judy actually did a an interview with den of geek about her parents and which is it's a great interview i'm not going to read everything but there was one question that i wanted to read her quote from cool and she was asked what would you like to dispel about your parents what's something that people always get wrong about them and she does she is completely obviously i know people can say bias but she is on the side of her parents not being grifters not being shady sure <clears throat> she says quote that they were in it for the fame or money or anything like that i think that was one thing that came up probably a lot and i had i had a hard time with that criticism they were really really trying and they always tried after my dad collapsed and he was a full patient he was a full care patient for 5 years he wasn't even really there. He was in the house, but you know, he wasn't there. My mom, she would take these calls in the middle of the night anyway and sit and talk to people. We wanted to change the house number so many times, but she wouldn't let us just so people could reach us. She'd sit and talk to you until the morning. Uh, She would sit and talk to people until they were comfortable enough to get back to sleep or uh, if they felt, or if they felt, okay, this will work or we'll talk to you in the morning. She would get back to them the next day. She so, was like a hotline 
Yeah, so, like, if people were, like, scared and didn't know what to do about, like, a haunting in their house, her, the like, Lorraine would just sit up and talk to people because they genuinely wanted to help people. It's so a haunted hotline. That's very cute. Haunted hotline. I like that a lot. So, TM, TM, TM. so anyway, I mean, she, you know, I imagine she would know her parents better than anybody, and I'm sure she also feels the need to defend them. I think it's a, a good angle of- to see. <clears throat> yeah. And I, again, I don't think Judy is wrong. I have... 100% faith that Lorraine really did do that stuff and I do also believe um, the Warrens when they say like we just wanted to help people and if you just want to help people but you also make money from it I think that's fine like I just I don't know how I don't know where the trickery comes in you know yeah it's hard to say where that line <laughs> showed up true yeah, so at all. Um, Judy I, I these are just three other quotes from the interview that have really nothing to do with anything, but I thought they were really precious. <laughs> um, or not precious. One of them was precious, but the three of them were all like worth noting. And one of them I okay. thought was precious where she was talking about her dad. And she said, my father always talked about ghost stories in my family. So we had fantastic Halloween parties and we oh. spent a lot of time walking around in cemeteries. And I was like, wow, you really had the life I wish I led. Like, that, I was going to say, <laughs> damn it, I'm jealous. Damn it, I'm jealous. And so another quote, uh, completely separate, is uh, she, they asked if she, like, if she was ever a skeptic to what her parents did. And she said she saw enough proof being around her parents that she couldn't have been a skeptic about what they did that she just like saw her own shit too many times after being around them and then they asked if she inherited any of her mom's gifts and um she said she might have inherited some of her mother's gifts but every time she has noticed something weird happening around her she backs away from letting herself be open to it but there have been Mm -hmm. times where she was able to like predict a death or things like that and she's been like i don't I don't need that. <laughs> She's like, I'm interesting. I've seen what it can do. At least, you know, it's it's an interesting <clears throat> angle to have the child of the parent or of the Warrens, but also to know that Judy's not like following in the family footsteps, but is still really like, no, I believe like, it's not like Judy's like now sign up for my <laughs> ghost right. course, you know? Which- well, they asked the interviewer asked, would there ever be like a legacy like right. someone in the family and she did say like oh i think my grandson might be interested in it but i'm not sure yet I, I interesting guess her- yeah i wonder if it's gonna pass through <clears throat> i don't know interesting so the next thing are the two lawsuits in 2013 after the first conjuring movie came out there was a huge lawsuit with uh warner brothers that is it's not actually about the warrens it's just a conjuring lawsuit scandal which i'll talk about but it leads in it comes back to the warrens later okay so the conjuring one which was about the parent family haunting soon after the movie premiered one of the producers named tony de rosa grund tried suing warner brothers slash new line because new line was the Mm -hmm. the uh, division of warner brothers that filmed this So Tony apparently owned the rights to like 8,000 case files of the Warrens. Um, And he was so the uh, people would be like, why does the producer happen to also conveniently have 8,000 case files of the Warrens? Yeah. So this guy on his own just happened to have 8,000 case files of the Warrens that he owned the rights to. And he agreed that out of those 8,000, he was going to license out 25 of them. 25 oh. of the case files to Warner Brothers, um, which, by the way, is like less than 1%. But he was like, here are 25 case files I think you could make a movie out of. Mm-hmm. P- you know, pick and choose whichever ones you want. But in return, uh, I want I want to be paid a fee- up like a f- uh, percentage of the movie and I want producer credits. Which so that's, makes sense. That happens a lot in the movie world. Of like, if you own the rights to something and a movie wants to make a film about it if you yeah. give them if you option out your rights usually they will give you a producer credit because you were involved in the production of the movie and you can often like have a say and yeah how, exactly. how the story goes yeah so he he gave them 25 case files to work with to make movies out of okay um and tony claims that in order to get around this agreement though like warner brothers didn't want him to this is all alleged and this is what tony is claiming okay. in his lawsuit 
is that the Warner Brother New Line division didn't want to give him producer credit, didn't want to have to pay him a percentage of the movie. And so to get around having to use any of his 25 cases um, while still writing about these movies without... Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. They ended up using... um, books that were written about the case and stuff oh that's not fair so they instead of using like his official documentation they were using books that authors wrote in as inspiration so the story itself wasn't even factual but if they were using that instead of his case files they were technically making a movie about the book and not his official paperwork which is really shady Sneaky. and like not legal i don't think because that's why so many production companies don't accept like blind script submissions because they throw them away right away because if they open it and then they happen to make a movie with the same yeah uh, plot then you have a right to say you have my you have your hands on my script you're stealing it right which is why they like don't <laughs> accept them so like if they're like oh we already have these but we're gonna go take the story from somewhere else like Exactly. I don't know. I think he has a case on his hands, is what I'm saying. If that's true. If that's true. So the book that they used instead was The Demonologist by Gerald. Okay. Ger- so I, it's weird because I mentioned Gerald Brittle separately earlier. I was and waiting I, for him to come back. You told me I'd know him by the end. <laughs> so Gerald Brittle, I used, I talked about him earlier because he wrote a book about the Arnie Cheyenne Johnson case. Oh, okay. But he also wrote the book that I mentioned earlier, The Demonologist, that talks about how Catholic the... Uh, uh, the family, the Warrens were. Right. <clears throat> so he happened to write two books that I'm mentioning in these notes. But so he um, he wrote the Arnie Cheyenne Johnson one. We'll deal with that later. But he wrote the 1980 book, The Demonologist. And that is where Warner Brother New Line was getting their information uh, from okay. instead of Tony's official documents. So from the get go, if they're going to make a movie based off of an, insp- an inspired book and not the official paperwork, the movie's already not going to be super accurate. Sure. Or that, that could be the fear. Um, and this book hinted that, uh, oh, oh, uh, also Gerald Brittle had written before that, like, this book hinted at the Enfield, uh, them being involved in the Enfield investigation, even though that was barely true. Um, Mm. this book was used for a few of the movies because they talked about The Conjuring, they talked about, um, or they talked about the Perrin family haunting in it, they talked about the Enfield poltergeist, but all of this book kind of implies, like, like s- some of the grifty things of like oh the it implied oh. that they were at the Enfield Poulter it never said that they were grifters or anything like that but people will use information from this book as reasons that they think the Warrens okay. were phonies so um for example in the book it said like oh yeah the Warrens were involved in the Enfield Poltergeist case but really they were only there for a day and so this mm. book itself just to give you an idea of how it's not 100% factual right and that's what Warner Brother was working off of. So Tony okay. was pissed that he was like, I literally gave you the rights to these case files and you're not using them. Yeah, that's um, shitty. If that's true, it's shitty. So basically, um, Warner Brothers chose not to use his totally accurate, uh, chose to use this not totally accurate book as inspiration for a movie instead of using the actual files in the case so that they could get around paying Tony for the rights. <laughs> that's that's pretty <clears throat> shitty. Allegedly. <laughs> if it's true. If it's true. <clears throat> Um, also, this makes their based on a true story disclaimer even more false because the movie Ugh. was based instead more on a loose interpretation of a true story. Yeah, um, y'all, I remember we learned that in grad school that like it's based on a true story does true story based on a true story. Yeah. They're all like varying degrees, but they like don't really mean they're <clears throat> they don't mean anything. <laughs> no, they don't mean anything. There's no like way like to based really... on a true story. Like here's a story. One time I ate a Chipotle burrito and then my face exploded. That's that's. <laughs> That's a story I told, and now you can write a movie based on a story. You know, like it's <laughs> like it, it's it could okay, be it's a true story. Em, come on, bring it back down to earth. You don't know. You ate what my life looks like. There was a cockroach, so I'm gonna tell a story about how there's a burrito that you ate, and there's a cockroach, and then your face exploded. But it's based on a true story of you fighting. You know what I mean? I feel like you can like spin a base. You can on a true take story. you can take one true fact and then completely unravel it into a completely different story. And yeah, it's, it's and then you can say based on a true story. Well, and then when it says inspired by a true story, that's them saying like we weren't even allowed to say based on a true story. Yeah, <laughs> so we had to take a step back and say inspired by a true story. That so was even less accurate. <laughs> so anyway, the based on a true story thing was like even more false than before yeah that's kind of icky 
<clears throat> so the official lawsuit that Tony brought to Warner Brothers is because since since they avoided using his official documents but made a movie about the information anyway, he thought that he should be paid because they were still using information that like, they really shouldn't, allegedly they shouldn't have used if, without using his rights yeah. or without b- he, like, paying for his rights. He handed it to them. Um, and so uh, on top of that, they were still making... Or they had plans to, like, make sequels, too. Like, not Uh, doing the same thing. (laughs) And he was like, I want to be paid my fair share in profits for the sequels as well. So, at the same time uh, that that's happening, uh, Gerald Brittle, who wrote The Demonologist, and they used that book instead, he is now suing Warner Brother and uh, New Line for $900 million. (gasps) Oh! For ripping off his book, because I don't know if... So they I, didn't get the rights to that either? I don't know. What I don't, on earth? It doesn't sound like it. What are um, they doing? So, and also to just to remind you, like, e- whether they were using Tony's uh, 25 case files that he was leasing out to them, or if they used Gerald Brittle's The Demonologist, either way, they were now making a movie franchise or starting up a movie franchise that would one day cost... Or uh, make over a billion dollars. So, Holy like, mother of God. So uh, Warner Brothers slash New Line, they were fighting Gerald Brittle by saying, like, yeah, we used your book as this movie concept. But even though you say we were ripping off your story, Warner Brothers says, quote, no one has a monopoly on telling stories about true life figures and events. That's so, not even true, though. Like, if he wrote the book and they're using the book, that's not even true, Warner <clears throat> Brothers. You know that. So they apparently, he, they're saying, like, you can tell a story about the Warrens and we can tell a story about the Warrens. And we, you know. But we're telling the story that you told first? Like, no. I Yeah, I don't totally understand. Um, if this is true, again, allegedly, that really irks me. Blows. So uh, Gerald Brittle, who, the writer of The Demonologist, he then says... The story wasn't even accurate because the Warrens told, or this is um, <clears throat> just like more awkward proof, by the way, going back to the potential grifting or the potential like f- oh. faking everyone out because Gerald Brittle, it came out in the lawsuit where he was like, yeah, you used my book, but guess what? My book wasn't even accurate because, uh-huh. <laughs> because apparently when he wrote the story about the Warrens and the demonologist, he thought that his information was right, but the Warrens later told him that the information wasn't true. So, right. So that's exactly the point is like, they're telling his story because his story was already a spin from what actually happened. So yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. Whatever. So I don't, and to be fair with he, I don't know if the Warrens told him that everything wasn't true, but he ended up finding out later with different evidence that the book he wrote ended up not being accurate. So he, he thought he was writing like a true, uh, a more true version of the Warrens and then later found out it wasn't true. And then Warner Brothers used that book anyway. So exactly. it was, so they were originally given 25, allegedly, they were allegedly. given 25 case files to pick from with all the accurate information of what those investigations looked like. Instead, right. they picked a loosely inspired book, which claimed to be true. And then after everything found out that it was even less true. So right. right. Anyway. And they can't say, oh, we didn't use the book. Cause it's like, well, then why do you have all these random facts that are only in the book that right. aren't even based on reality? Yeah, that's baloney. So he ends up claiming, uh, the Gerald Brittle, he claims that Warner Brother used the book's false narrative for the inspiration. Uh, it all goes along with, like, Tony's claims of, like, yeah. I mean, we get it. We get it. Anyway. I get it. I get it. Experts say that Warner Brothers was within their rights because they used the disclaimer at the end. Not that it was based on a true story, but they used another disclaimer at the end of the movie to say that the story was dramatized. Um, Come on. So it kind of excused them of like, none of this was accurate. Like so many loopholes, man. So this is where it gets really not cute for the Warrens. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. So... In the middle of this lawsuit, I don't totally understand how this happened. I don't understand what what steps happened for this to come out as information. But during this legal battle, further information surfaced in 2014. So a year after this lawsuit started, more info is coming out. And somehow it surfaces 
that there is this woman named Judith Penny. Okay. Okay. And Judith Penny, in a sworn declaration, a year after this lawsuit comes out, information that she says in this sworn declaration says that in 1963, when Ed was in his mid 30s, he began a relationship with her and she was 15. <gasps> With the consent and full knowledge of his wife, Lorraine. What? Again, I don't know if this is true. I'm just stating what happened or what I know. I so, had no idea about this. Me either. So now I'm this part alone. I'm like, is this what people wanted me to cover? Like I'm in which case, like, wouldn't it have gone to you? Because it's more true crimey. No, I assume people just want you to cut because they're such famous, like paranormal <clears throat> figures. I assume people just wanted to hear the f- they probably don't even, I mean, not everybody probably even knows. So, like, right. that's why they want you to cover it. So, anyway, if people were wondering how the Warrens might be controversial. Well, this I is, get it now. This is the closest thing I could find to it. So, Judith Penny uh, says that when Ed was in his 30s in 1963, he began a relationship with her uh, when she was 15 with the full knowledge and consent of his wife. And his daughter's name is Judy, right? Like, that's kind of That weird. is something I was going to mention later. Oh, okay. His daughter <laughs> is also named Judy. Yes. Yeah, it's like, that's a little odd, and, but okay. And she was, to be fair, I was like, oh, my God, was the baby born after this? And the baby was named Judy, and like, because of her? That's no, what the, I was wondering. The baby, Judy already was born. <clears throat> so it, it's just a coincidence that he Judy's ended up. already born. Okay, got you, got you. Got it's you. just okay. coincidental that this person's name is also Judith. Okay. Um, she met him when he was a city bus driver because uh, at that time they were getting into the ghost paranormal world, but they weren't able to survive off of that. So he was doing sure. other odd jobs. So he was a bus driver. And I think he was picking her up from high school, homie. I was about like, to say, tell me it was a school. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, and their relationship, according to her, which I guess, thank God, she says the relationship was amorous. And she wanted this relationship. I know she was 15. It was a sexual relationship, which means it was rape. Um, But at the very least, I rest easier knowing that she was not, uh, according to her, forced into this. You know what I I mean? It was like, it's still not good. It's still not okay. It's still not okay. But at at the very least, like, she wasn't like, this wasn't wasn't a violent violent forced situation thing. Right. I got you. Ugh, it's not good. This is not good. If this is true, this is not good. If, if it's true, not it's true, really it's bad. still not good that this is this information is floating around. No. Um, uh, also, side note, I wanted to take a moment and educate the two of us. I feel like we have been interchanging. And sorry, these are trigger warning words. Um, S-A and the R word. Um, but... I think a lot of times I have felt uncomfortable saying the R word rape because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to trigger anybody if that is something they've had to go through. But uh, I have also seen floating around the internet that calling it sexual assault is downplaying it. So um, I am just, I don't know what the right words to say are because I don't want to say something that is downplaying a situation, but I also don't want to trigger anyone's trauma. So but I, I have mean, seen to be fair, like my stories almost <laughs> very often cover rape anyway. And OK, so it's like, so I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying the word rape. But I do want to make sure that it would be clear that a man yeah, in his yeah, 30s yeah. sleeping with a 15 year old is statutory at the very rape. least statutory yeah. rape. Right. Um, allegedly. So uh, she does say that their relationship started when she was 15 It was, quote, amorous. It was also sexual. And many times he allegedly told her that she was the love of his life. Um, Judy, Judith, Judith also, um, this is where it gets kind of crazy that, like, you would think this is, like, a one and done situation. Judy, Judith, Judith literally moved into their house. What? And stayed in a room across the hall from them. And he would switch rooms every other night. (gasps) For which bed he was going to stay like in. some medieval shit. <clears throat> so over the years, she ended up moving out of the bedroom and into her own space that was built onto the house. I and she like lived with them for 40 years. Sorry, four zero? Four zero years. Did we not, like, know this? It's just like... Since Judith was 55. Wait, Which means she... eventually... 
So, uh, so no, sorry. Until she was fifty-five. Oh, until, so from holy from shit. fifteen to fifty-five, right? Till he died, probably in his like eighties or nineties. They broke up three years before he died. Shut up. So for his whole, that's not good. I I don't I don't know where I mean it's not good that it, from fifteen to eighteen it certainly wasn't good but I mean if you're there in three or fifties like was it at that point a legitimate relationship or was I she, don't know because I feel like if it starts off as like was she a manipulative like, like, yeah alert into this because like I also a minor yeah and I I don't think it, I I'm trying I, I'm in real time trying to figure out what words I want to use but I do understand I'm I'm not giving this any backup that there it, like it started in rape okay right but i do want to say like i don't want the concept of us being grossed out that someone can no, happily have no. multiple partners like if this no. was a thing where like they Not were polygamists uh, polygamists or they were into polyamory sorry yeah they, uh if they were if they believed in multiple partners and were happy that way awesome but it is not good that this well, started a with a 15 year old child. No. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think any, anyone that, uh, you know, chooses polyamory for themselves is, you know, going to be offended. They're not the same thing. No. Yeah. I don't think they claim that story, but I also no, want to no, say no. like, we're not grossed out at the concept that like he had two partners if no. they were both adults and like cool with I it. I think it's awkward that he, his daughter and his 15 year old partner had the same name, yes, but that, you know, that's besides the that's point. That's also guess. odd. And it's not a cute look that, um, she start she was that young. It's not cool that Lorraine was also cool with it. Yeah. What on earth is that about? Yeah. I don't know. Like if you're gonna like have like a secondary partner, then like go find someone who's not fucking 15. A child who um, rides your school bus. What? Who, yeah right oh my god oh my god oh my god did judy the daughter ever say anything about this we will get there oh god so, okay um if people ever asked who she was because she literally lived in their house for four zero years um if she if they ever asked people would say she was a niece or a neighborhood girl that they took in which makes See, it that's real sketchy shady in and of, that's yes, that's sketchy in and of itself like they like, knew better they knew better they it, right allegedly like, if this really happened well and i want to be better. clear here too this is not under catholic uh-huh rules okay so uh-huh. he's claiming to be a devout catholic well he's not doing a great job of it bingo bango christine Damn. Um, but yeah, if you have to lie about who they are, you know better, right? There's something shady. Oh, yeah, unless it's like you're protecting. So, but but this is not 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 in this case. No, no. Not so good. apparently, in this sworn declaration, <sighs> if uh, at at some point someone noticed that she was really young and not their child and was living with them and called the police, <gasps> and the police tried to get her to formally admit it and when she wouldn't they sent her to a juvenile center for a month and oh, then she had geez. to do like meetings after that but like even ed drove her to the meetings <gasps> like it was weird it's weird i don't like it no in 1978 when she is a whole ass woman by the way in her 30s she got pregnant with him oh, okay. and lorraine apparently made her get an abortion because <gasps> it would make the warren name look bad because in 1978 this was their prime peak fame oh my god this just gets worse and worse which by the way also not very catholic in abortion no, um actually the opposite like the literal opposite of catholic but in 1978 that. they were like they could not have been more at the peak of their fame so this was going to be like a real crisis for pr allegedly this is all that happened just so you know um so judith this actually makes it even more sad is that judith there's a quote about this ex- this moment in time and judith said quote they wanted me to tell everyone that someone had come into my apartment and r worded me <gasps> and i wouldn't do that i was so scared i didn't know what to do but i had the abortion and that night they picked me up from the hospital after having it and they went out to a lecture and I'm left me cry. alone this is so cry. fucked up this Alleg- is bad again allegedly but also wow story. so yeah. fucked up really bad really sad so fucked up um now i'm understanding why people were like hey like maybe cover the warrens and learn something about the warrens like just oh before God, you're always no talking clue. about them. 
So I had no clue either. I had no clue. So I haven't seen The Conjuring. I'm so like, oh so, god! I went to the so bright eyed and bushy tailed. I know. Yeah. Last week eyed. you sounded so happy. Um. Uh, so well, this is what I do to you every week. So I yeah. guess it's punishment. <laughs> I just strung it out for a week. So um, my thought this whole time was why? First of all, why did Lorraine allegedly agree to this when she was? When there was a 15 year old that her husband wanted to sleep with, like, and then move in with sure. them. I think, by the way, she moved in when she was 18, just to clarify. Okay, that well, that's good. I mean, good, not good, but it's like at least. It's not I also wonder yet? if Lorraine didn't totally know until she was 18. I don't sure. know. I don't know, because I don't want to. I don't know. I just, I'm throwing we that out there that she might have been fine with it because she didn't know how early it started. Um, just putting that out there as a potential. Um, sure. But also, here's another reason that Lorraine might have been okay with it, quote, okay with it, is Judith says that Ed was abusive and uh, would beat Lorraine sometimes until she was unconscious. Fuck me. Are you serious right and now? And said that they thought, she thought they might kill each other. So he's just a bad guy, allegedly, according to her angle. She's, allegedly a bad, a bad guy, especially because, and then like, but then I'm so thrown because in like other documentaries and videos I saw, they are not only painted as like some people who are so in love and like, there's no way that that would be the behind the scenes storyline, but even like, well, I guess if this is true and she was the victim, she could just be saying things out of fear. Yeah, I mean, but she, it, it always seemed like her and the kids and everyone were always like, they were so in love. Like, I want that relationship. So who, I don't know. I don't know, but it's, it's, this is very, this is only, and I'm not trying to, if this really did happen, I feel so bad for this person. However, it is one person um, who was saying I couldn't there was no other information alluding to abuse or anything like that that I saw except for this one so this is um, one angle declaration right. this yeah. is one angle yes um and if this is what really happened to Judith I I totally eat my words and I'm so sorry this happened to you yes um so anyway all this information came out uh because of the conjuring lawsuit with Tony's <sighs> producer rights and Tony, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> Tony's producer rights and um, Gerald Brittle with the demonologist suing them at, I think at the same time they were dealing with these two things. And Jesus. I, my question is like, how the fuck did these two people get this information from Judith? Like, how did that happen? Like, I don't know where it came from. This information is kind of ha- fell out at the same time. And I, I think it was, their way of saying like well did you know all of this stuff and how bad the warrens are why would you even want to write stories for these people or did, make movies about these people did lorraine die before judith came forward uh she was so she was in her 90s and had like really intense dementia i think maybe it was a scenario where like she finally felt comfortable to maybe and it was like in the news and maybe she just wanted to put her story out or who knows yeah so so um i'm gonna mention this a little bit later but she so L- lorraine was alive but i don't think she was capable of saying anything like i don't yeah. think so yeah i don't maybe know that's maybe. why judith wanted to like share yeah. her piece finally so according to tony uh <sighs> the warren's daughter judy <clears throat> the daughter yep um she apparently lived with her grandma while judith lived at the house for 40 years which uh so and judith does say in her declaration she says i was the only girl who lived there and this was confirmed by the daughter too in uh separate interviews where she said that she lived with her grandparents maybe it is convenient that her name was the same so they didn't (laughs) maybe mix it up (laughs) yikes well she apparently uh because her parents were always traveling for investigate investigations and the lecture circuit and all this, it was she just lived with the grandparents, and so she was never there. And that so that does confirm the fact that Judith was there by herself. So, um, do we have any proof that like they did have this Judith person living with them? Like, do we know that for sure? Just testimony. Okay. Just just hearsay. There's no like census records from 19. 19- oh, I don't know. Actually, I'm sh- there. Maybe I should have looked that up. I don't know. 
<laughs> that's actually not that bad because I do have an ancestry account. So yeah, now I'm gonna go. I have check. a newspapers.com. I don't. My brother does, but I use it. So if we, we need, can. If we we'll need. go check for sure. But then also, you know what it would say? Judy Warren, if they were trying to, which was their daughter's name, it would say Judith Warren if they were trying to just excuse that she was a distant relative, right? That's true. If they were lying, I mean, yeah, you're right. They said they. She said that they lied about it. Her identity. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it would wow. say literally the same name as the daughter. What so was her it name? just Judith said something. J- Judith, um, uh, Judith Penny. Penny. Wow. Well, now we're gonna go get real investigative in a second. But I'm, I'm like itching to figure this mystery out. Conspiracy. Well, let me. I'll I'll finish. I'll finish with this part then, and just say, um, Judith Judy Warren, the daughter states mm-hmm. that judith actually oh i'm so sorry i i forgot there actually is a little bit of proof that she lived there oh, so okay. a little bit um judy warren does state that judith was taken in as a house sitter when they were not around so when they were traveling she stayed there um just to take care of like picking up the phone and things the like that <laughs> the plans um they okay. also say that judith um wouldn't have been uh this is Judy Warren saying like, yeah, she was a house sitter, but she also wouldn't have been with Ed because she had a boyfriend for years who she later married. But then again, like if Ed was married and with somebody yeah, like really she could be engaged in with someone. So whatever. So Judy's um, saying that's not true is what we're, we're Judy says at. it's not true. She did live with them, but it she was does as know a, of her and it was at, as a house sitter. And it, that was it. So at least it's not just a <laughs> random person off the street trying to get in on the story. Like it's an actual yeah, Judith Somebody just says it was with the family. Judith just says it was much more. I guess she's saying it was more sinister. That part about the abortion makes it sound like it was. Pretty oh, it bad. sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so in after this all fe- came out about like the Warrens' character, Tony, who is fighting with them for the producer rights, he said, "Quote." Ed was a pedophile, a sexual predator, and a physically abusive husband. Lorraine enabled Ed to do this. She knowingly allowed this illegal relationship to continue for 40 years, and they lied to the public. Wow. That's a bold, big, bold statement. And wow. Tony tried to threaten, and this, by the way, this email went to, like, Warner Brother top executives, mm. like the president of New Line, I think, or something, like, it, or something on that level. Like, so people knew about this as the Conjuring movies were coming out. And this was, they were in the middle of making the sequel. Like, they, and they ended up, um, apparently at one point, Tony even said, like, if you are going to make a sequel, first of all, I want my fucking money. Yeah. And he also said, um, excuse me. He also said that he had promised Judith that he would come to the top execs and as his, with his rights as a producer, which they were not giving him he was like first of all i want to be made a producer and then from there i want to tell you that you need to rewrite the narrative of ed and lorraine's love story in the movies because in the movies they are known as like very wonderfully in love and no abuse no signs of abuse and so he was like as a producer i would want you to be more accurate with their relationship (laughs) um and he was writing this like top execs of like if you're gonna keep doing this at least make it mm-hmm. accurate blah 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 blah. Um, wow. And Tony tried to threaten the exec executives that he uh, that he was suing that if he didn't do this if they didn't do this if they didn't change the story up or pay him his rights or you know handle Gerald Brittle or whatever it was then Judith would come forward to the media about the story. Like if they didn't if they didn't settle Judith was going to it come out publicly about what the Warrens were up to Oof. as you're in the middle of writing a sequel about the Warrens and how in love they are. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. And the lawsuit said that the studio ignored the truth about these people quote to protect its billion dollar franchise. Well, sure it did. Of course it so, did. Um, Warner brother slash new line. Their attorney says that Tony was quote, just pushing the story of the Warrens personal lives as part of a vendetta to win his case. And Lorraine, this is kind of odd, and it does it's a, not a cute look. Uh-oh. Apparently, um, when we're all wondering, like, is this true? Is this not true? Like, what do, like, what what version of the movie of the book of Judith's story? Yeah. What what's going on? <clears throat> it is interesting to note that since Lorraine was still alive when The Conjuring came out, and probably was put on as a producer or some sort of consultant or whatever it was. She had a contract with the films with a very weird and 
not common caveat. Like a stipulation or something? A stipulation in her contract that (gasps) the portrayal of the Warrens would, quote, never be presented in a light where they were, quote, engaging in crimes, including sex with minors, (gasps) child pornography, prostitution, or sexual assaults. What? And neither the husband nor wife would be depicted as particular participating in extramarital sexual relationships that was in the fucking contract that was in her contract and there was like and there were like talent agents who are like that is not a common that's not normal holy crap that's shady if that's it's very for sure it's apparently in there and it's very i don't know i'll say allegedly just to you know because i'm not i'm not sure i haven't looked at the contract but this is written up in the uh i think the hollywood reporter right so, oh well that's a fucking source wow I, I, I think it was the hollywood reporter there was this this was the whole expose i was talking about so wow um, talk about a fucking expose and so it's very specific language for a contract um, Yeah. if there wasn't something they were trying to cover up and it's unclear if warner brothers like took them seriously or did took any action but they did make the couple in the sequel still look very much in love and they like completely ignored the request to change it up. I mean, I guess that would take away from the story anyway. So I don't right. see why they didn't want to. It's shitty. I see as a director, how you wouldn't even really want to focus on the relationship yeah. at all. <laughs> so it doesn't seem relevant. I mean, in the, for a ghost story, tell, for, a, right, for, exactly. yeah, for a poltergeist story. Exactly. Um, so Judith, apparently, again, I don't know if this was some Stockholm syndrome shit, but, um, Judith did actually stay friends with Ed after they broke up in 2003. And then for oh, those Judith three, did? Judith stayed friends with him <gasps> after they broke wow. up 40 years later. Um, and he died in 2006. She was never close with Lorraine, which Awkward. does not shock me. Um, so that's it, basically. Let me. Wow, uh, I had no idea. I also had no idea. And if this really? is what people were talking about, I get it. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anyway. a good job not getting this out there. <laughs> yeah. If it's so, true, you know. Anyway, so there's that. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, do what you want with it. Take that information. And I, I don't, again, all of this was alleged, although it was like a massive expose where all this information came out. And I don't know how much of it was just to make Warner Brothers try to redo their contracts or use yeah. producer rights and things just kind of surfaced i don't know what the deal is but that is apparently Do you know how like did any is it still in progress or like i never found out how it ended up settling no do it, you know I, when that expose was written by 2017 nations? oh okay i think so still pretty recent yeah i don't know um it didn't as far as i saw in the article i didn't see like a this is what everyone settled on i th- i don't i i don't know I don't, honestly don't what even... a fucking story. I mean, yeah, December 13th, 2017 is when that expose came out. It's, if you're interested, uh, Hollywood Reporter. I looked at, by the way, I looked at a bunch of other articles too, but this was like absolutely the, the most meaty of information. Uh, Hollywood Reporter does some good stuff. It's called War Over the Conjuring, the disturbing claims behind a billion dollar franchise. I had no clue. I mean, I don't know anything about horror movies or whatever, but wow. Yep. So Who there would have thought? There is that. If I do watch those movies, I won't. But if I do, I'll have a different spin on these two lovey-dovey old people involved. Or I know. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. And it also, again, it was kind of that thing we always talk about with your stories of, like, was someone who was a victim of abuse, like, more in trouble for enabling the abuser's behavior with someone else? Sure. But, but so for Lorraine, I don't know what her story is. And she, unfortunately, was... Uh, like, they, they had a lawyer, a family lawyer, who all said, like, this woman did house it for them. Actually, the in the book, The Demonologist, apparently she was even mentioned as, like, oh. someone who, like, took a message on a phone call at one point. So there's, like, written proof that she lived there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know what Lorraine's story was. I don't know if she found out once the girl was 18. I don't know if she was getting abused and, like, didn't have a say. I don't right. know if that she was... Right, that changes the whole thing. I exactly. don't know if she was... For all we know, she was, like, super money hungry and was, like, you can't ruin our family name. But also it could have been, like, you can't ruin our family name because then Ed's going to be pissed at both of us or well, something. I, like, like, right. Knows? If, if she who was knows? a victim of abuse, also, that changed the whole dynamic of, like, you can't 
blame her. Yeah, it's, yeah. oh my god, what a fucking story. And also, dude. like, if you're with somebody for 40 years, is that a valid relationship if the first three were you being statutorily raped? You know, yeah, like. I don't know. I don't know where the, I don't know, I don't know. It's don't a, it's very tricky stuff, it's so. Like a, an ethics course conversation. Yeah. yeah. Whew, wow, Em, you really, you really got uh, Again, me let me put here. this all under the blanket of all of this is alleged because uh, yeah. I don't know enough to make a firm stance. Yeah. Wow. What a story, though, either way. I mean, just even the I lawsuits don't know. alone. I know. I don't know how you do this every week, Christine, talking about crime like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I have, like, I'm, like, I have a migraine. All right, Amethy. Well, I have part two as well for you this week. Do you, do you remember <gasps> oh, our story? Fo- Foxy Noxy. Foxy Noxy. You oh, remember. Oh, my goodness. And so, wait a minute. Foxy Noxy. So, last I... Oh, I just remembered how mad I was it's really about stressful. everything. It's a stressful wow. story. All right. Well, I went from, like, a 10 out of 10 <laughs> to, like, a 3 out of 10 um, instantly. Okay. So, essentially, the last thing that I talked about uh, in last week's episode was this... Giuliano, you know, my arch ne- arch nemesis, uh, Giuliano <laughs> Menini's uh, yes. description where he says, oh, it must have been a Halloween sex game, of course. Fucking um, guy. Oh, my- what's his last name? <laughs> Mignini. It's M-I-G-N-I-N-I. I'm going to just Italian. call him the Meanie, the by the way, because yeah. I fucking Giuliano, hate Mr. Meanie. him. Okay, right. Yes. Okay. So Woo. Mr. Meanie had this whole notion and, and there was like this Taiwanese mock-up of like this 3D animated like where she walks in and she, uh, Meredith's like, oh my gosh, you have two boys here. How could you? And Amanda's like, I'll show you for judging me and then stabs her in the throat. And it's like, there's no evidence to support this. That's just his story that he came up with. And I guess that's where he stood and the police stood. Great. So that's the last thing uh, I covered. So now we're in January of 2009 and uh, Amanda and Raphael have been in jail for 14 months. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally their murder trial begins in Perugia it's decided that the proceedings can be held with the media president president with the media present but there's no live television coverage allowed Uh, so six months later June of 2009 six months later yeah these things take forever man she's She's still in jail oh yeah she's been there for 14 months (laughs) now she's on trial but like she doesn't take the stand for six months while the trial's happening this shit takes forever man what? it's not like the actual what happened to this she had to be in jail for like three months because she which like by the way was already horseshit <laughs> i thought it was just three months uh i don't know was it three months maybe i, I just know. wasn't thinking in my head i i i think maybe i added it up and i went that's not true that's not possible yeah uh, i'm trying to see if last I, I checked it was like that ruby guy he was in trouble, right. and then they needed to wait three more months for... Oh, right, yes. They were ordered to stand trial in three months' um, time, uh-huh. but they'd already been in jail. So, <gasps> like, this this oh, is... Oh, no. I didn't even process that. Yeah, so, yes, exactly. So, Ugh. that was just a reference to, at one point, when Rudy's trial was happening, they had to wait for their trial three months later. But they'd already been in there for like, I don't know, nine months or something. So Christine Chief. <laughs> now it's been 14 to. months. The trial begins. She takes a stand six months into the trial because this is like a huge case. So, yeah, sucks. Fucking sucks. I, wow. I'm angry. Wow. OK. Yeah. And during all this, it's just like blowing up everywhere that, you know, her sex narrative, her diary is being exposed like. She just can't get a fucking break. Oh, my God. I um, forgot about the HIV thing. Yeah. The, the HIV thing. Oh, my thing. God. And she did talk about it at one point. Like, she felt so hopeless. She was like, I considered suicide. Like, I just didn't know what to well, do. Well, yeah. She's alone there. Her family's in a different country. I mean, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. How is this legal? How is this legal? How is this? How is this legal? I don't know. How if you're it- waiting trial and you're in jail, you're, you're in jail, even if you were found innocent after your trial. And but you know but she but they proved they like they made it so clear that it was that it wasn't her like well you're not gonna like the rest of the story then (laughs) yes I'm just gonna stop I just have to accept I just I forgot how angry I was yeah it's bad it it really keeps coming in waves makes my tum tum hurt a little bit um 
So she finally takes a stand at her own trial six months in. And as she's done already time and time again, she explained what happened that night. She had been at Raphael's house where she received a text message from Patrick Lumumba, her boss, saying she didn't have to come into work. She replied with the infamous text saying, see you later. Not literally, Mm -hmm. but that's how they took it. They then smoked weed, watched Amelie, had sex and went to sleep. And also they read Harry Potter. But that's, I guess, besides the point. In... Uh, what was it in German. Italian and German? <laughs> yeah, they saw photos of like the scene, and there was literally a German. Uh, I have the German Harry Potter books, and I was like, "Oh, I have that book <laughs> it's sitting there." Um, so the next morning, she woke up and returned to her house, and that's where she discovered the body, called Raphael. Or she didn't discover the body; she saw the blood and the feces, called Raphael. Right. He called the military police. They broke down the door, etc. So when asked about her relationship with Meredith, um, her roommate, she denied any claims that they didn't get along. I mean, they went to the chocolate festival for oh God's sake. right i forgot about the chocolate festival <laughs> how could you forget about the chocolate festival I, I, because i just got so filled with rage oh and, yeah about everything else just think i'm gonna need chocolate a chocolate factory. festival after this my mom just got back from germany and she i said the only thing i want is milka chocolate and she's coming over later today and she's bringing me the chocolate <laughs> so you imagine if she forgets happy. I will literally make her turn, get back in the car, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not an option, M. Okay. Um, I'm very excited. Anyway, so when asked why she had signed this confession saying she was there and her boss did it, she explained that she'd only done it because she was put under this intense police right. like pressure. And 53 br- hours of duress. Yes. Uh, yeah. Under duress. Uh, brutality. They fucking hit her in the head. Um, and in the huh? prosecution. Yeah. Remember they like slapped her. No, I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. They slapped her uh, and said, remember. And they screamed. I remember them screaming, remember, remember. But I don't remember them hitting her in the head. Yeah, they physically, they they hit her in the head. It just Um, keeps getting fucking worse. Yeah, a man literally just slapped her. So, woof. Uh, uh Uh-huh. Didn't let her get a lawyer, etc. And so she says, like, I only said it because I was under this, you know, pressure. And I felt deranged. Like, they were altering my conscious, my reality, blah, blah, blah. So in the prosecution, Mignini, who keeps being like, why would you say it if you didn't mean it? Uh, he he pushed the motive that Amanda killed Meredith as part of a sex game, as we know. Halloween um, sex game. Uh, to be specific, a Halloween sex game. Mm-hmm. Or an All Saints Day sex game, which doesn't sound quite as <laughs> quite as fun. Um, and of course, Amanda was like, and he says this had to do with Raphael and Rudy, uh and she was like the mastermind and so of course she's like no that's nothing that didn't happen we were Mm. watching amelie (laughs) leave me alone um but the prosecution claimed knox was sex crazed one quote lifted from lumumba's lawyer who (laughs) i guess turned on her because she had initially implicated him so got it even though she was pressured into that like Mm -hmm. she said he was guilty so his lawyer carlo pacelli called amanda a she devil who loves wild sex and who knowingly lied to police to sidetrack the investigation. He asked the court, who is Amanda Knox? Is she the mild-looking, fresh-faced person you see here, or the one devoted to lust, drugs, and alcohol that emerges from the court documents? It's like, oh. wow. She had sex with seven people, and you told her she had HIV. Yeah. And now she's like a she-devil who loves wild sex? What she's are you a talking she, about? She's a she-devil because she had sex with her boyfriend one time, and that was one of seven men in her entire life. And she literally And also, she once. doesn't... She kissed him once. She doesn't have HIV, but we don't know that. And uh, wow. she's the devil, obviously. And it's like, if this were a sex game, there were two other people involved. But of course, it's the woman's fault that she wrangled them in and they had no control. You know, oh it's just God. another fucking like horrible patriarchal look at this of like, oh, well, she was the ringleader. She was the witch who like controlled the men. And it's like, oh, so they had no fucking self-control and they stabbed someone in the throat. But it's yeah. her fault. Like just pisses me off um so to support their case the prosecution would refer to amanda and Raphael's behavior ever since the body was found aka their kiss the lingerie shopping the diary entries they said it was all part of her evil ways and then rudy fucking get took the stand and rudy has already been convicted and Mm -hmm. sentenced to 30 years yeah and And he said he said something that he saw a silhouette of her yes so he's about to show up on stand and speak against Amanda. I guess, like you said, to like lower his own guilt in the case, to shorten his own sentence. Who knows? But he shows up and everyone's like, wait, what the fuck? This guy's already in prison for this. And now he's showing up. And 
So, as reported by ABC News, the one person already convicted of the crime appeared in an Italian courtroom today and said he saw Amanda Knox leaving the cottage as her British roommate lay dying of a knife wound to the throat. He ended his statement by turning to the lawyer representing Kircher's family, uh, Meredith's family, Mm -hmm. and said, I want the Kircher family to know that I did not kill and did not rape their daughter. It was not me that took her life away. And it's like, your semen was found in her body. Right. You admit it. Like... Um, you've like your evidence was all your evidence was evidence was all over the place that your dna was there you were like the bloody crime scene he literally confessed to this by the way like he like or he said that he was in the bathroom and then someone stabbed he her said oh i happened to be in the other room yeah when somebody when and and he said oh amanda wasn't there and now he's on try on stand saying Oh, actually, she was there and she did it. And it's like, you've already been convicted. Sit the fuck down, man. All the tiny little things that, you know, all the, oh, she wasn't there. Actually, she was there as a silhouette have, has completely changed to I saw her in person and we talked. She was completely there and she was outside the window and she loves Halloween sex games and yep. it's all her fault. And he said, I want, he looked at Meredith. This is sick. He looked at Meredith's family. It was like, I want the Kircher film to know I did not kill and right. rape their daughter. And it's like. But, like, you did, though. Like, your evidence was inside her. Yeah, and all like, yep. you did, though. So, I don't know. You've already been convicted of it. It's not even allegedly. Like, you literally have been... You're in prison for it. Whatever. Right, right. So, um, even though this was, like, a big gasp moment for the whole uh, crowd at the trial, uh, Knox's... Amanda's legal team were, like, totally... <laughs> they, like, got real fired up about this. And said, today does not affect Amanda's trial because no one believes Rudy Gede. He is not reliable. He is a liar. Hmm. Uh, even the prosecutor said this today. He has changed his stories, which, like, yeah, he had. Like, yeah, he, mo- so many times. Like, 180 <laughs> degrees. Like, he completely wow. changed the story. <clears throat> so, the fact that anybody would be like, wow, what a hard-hitting testimony. It's like, no, mm-hmm. he's full of shit. He's just trying to get his jail sentence lowered. Yep. Um, so as Amanda's defense team pointed out, Gede's DNA was found all over the crime scene and on the victim, inside the victim. Um, Amanda's and Raphael's were only on select items like the bra clasp and the knife. And so then <clears throat> Amanda's defense team was like, how would Amanda and Raphael have cleaned up only their DNA, but left, but left everyone else's? Rudy's. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Unless you're able to wipe all the way around every little fingerprint and just... Yeah. <laughs> Are you or like me? skin flake. Like every right. little piece of uh, DNA that you would have left behind, they were able God. to clean up everything except Rudy's, which was all over the room. So it's like, that's a stupid argument. I love fired up Christine, by the way, because I know usually <laughs> you don't pick a side and now every other word is like, they're I'm so fully, stupid. I'm it's truly true. on her side because I just, I can't, I can't bring myself to nothing. None of this convinces me, I guess. Like they have yet to prove to me yeah, beyond reasonable doubt that she did anything, but whatever. And the bra clasp, even though it had Amanda's or I think it had, Raphael's DNA on it. It was discovered 46 days after the murder. What? And yeah, and they had not like co- cordoned off the crime scene. Like people were going in and out. Um, they were looking at multiple pieces of evidence at once. Um, Rudy and Amanda had not Rudy. Uh, Raphael and Amanda had been in and out. So like, it's entirely possible some of his DNA got in the room or her DNA got in the room without um, well, even her like having to she... be involved. Yeah, because it was the it was the knife, right? That she was like, I don't know how to explain that. Like, yeah, I don't, it's like I mean, like yeah, DNA just kind of travels, like mm-hmm. just that's the that's why we try to follow it for a crime. <laughs> and hmm, yours was there. <laughs> yeah, and 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 uh, Rudy's was all over the room. Amanda's was found in like very tiny, small, select places. Same with Raphael's. Um, and we're, we'll get back to the knife because that is just turns out to be a whole. Oh, God. Okay. Bunch of bullshit. But, um, right. So they're like, how on earth, DNA, which is untraceable to the human eye a lot of the time, how would they have selectively cleaned up only their DNA and left Rudy's? That doesn't make any sense. Um, They're not pinning it on Rudy with his DNA. And one of the guy, one of the forensic experts said something really interesting, which, because I never totally knew how, like you said, how easily DNA travels, but he said, like, things as minuscule as skin flakes if you if you he said if you rub your arm in a room yeah. like they can find dna 
I learned this because I, I because they say like ninety percent of dust is actually like skin particles. Yeah, or something. I hate like, that fact. It's something gnarly like it's that. It's always in the same listicle where they say like you eat twenty five bugs a year in yeah. your mouth when you're sleeping. <laughs> God, it's like it's like, hey, all the things you hate about living. Um, no, whenever I whenever I think of how much of dust is actually skin, I think about it every time I sweep. Where I'm like, oh, this Cute. is just me, RJ, and Allison's skin having That's why a you hug. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You're right. I just shouldn't do it anymore. I mean, I don't. So. But so I always think, like, how the hell did all of this happen? And it's just got to be like just. You know, yeah, you just, just if you walk through, you. if your hair falls off you, if you end up like sweating or if yeah. you're crying or if you're spitting and you're talking, I mean, who knows? But so it's not hard to get your DNA spread out. So if the bra class was found 46 days later after the murder and the crime scene hadn't been like cordoned off, there could be any number of ways that the DNA got on there. So that's just not yeah. a fair argument. Um, so on December 4th, 2009, after 50 hearings, while the so the trial had started in January, um, and 2009. Yes. And then she took stand in June and now oh. it's December. <laughs> so this has been going on a full year. Um, the trial. And she's oh still in jail. Oh my God. Wait, <laughs> didn't horrible. this start in 2007? Yeah. That's when the murder took place. Okay. But she's been in jail for a year. Well, I think she's probably been in jail since the murder, since she was arrested for the murder. So, so 2000, since 2007. July 11, 2008 was when she was arrested. So, so a year and a half. Yes, a year and a half. <gasps> that's yeah. like seven Whoa. Months. That's, it's one of those things where like you, can, you don't even have the words to explain M- my anger, but also like my, uh, I, like I want to empathize so badly, but I, cu- I couldn't even begin to tell you where, how to feel it's, i couldn't you can't imagine. grasp it no I, it's, it, it is and that's insane. why i thought it was really interesting when she said like it's people's fear that this could happen to anyone that ma- makes them want to think i'm guilty because they don't want to think like, right oh well she's totally innocent the world is just fucked up and this just happened and it could happen to me or my daughter or... just stuck in jail for a year <laughs> and a half for something you didn't do well and, and like for, other... and not even not even getting convicted you're just stuck there you're just like waiting and i mean that's it happens here too. It's pretty, you know, that's just how it works. It's, oh my God. Unless you're Ugh. out on bail, you know? I know, but it's just one of those, yeah, it's also one of those things that not only I hope would never happen to me, but I don't even think about it. So for, yeah, why, when it, why would you, right? When all of a sudden it comes into my head that it's even a possibility exactly. that I'm like, no, 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 no. In a foreign wow. country, you're just like over there with your new love. And like, that makes it so much worse for some reason. Like you're already in a horrible situation, but on top of it, you're, there's a language barrier. And so oh you just God. feel even like all you had left was language. And now you language don't even have Language and culture. Yeah, exactly. You're just learning this new place. Wow. It, it, and you're not even 20. You're 20 years old. Like I can't tell them. Like you're all like you're already so confused for how you even got in there, but you can't even talk to anyone about it. No. No, and, and you write in a diary, and they literally put it in the fucking National Enquirer. Yeah, you so can't even like... write to yourself. You can't even write to your fucking self. <laughs> the Daily oh Mail my God. gets to share it with everybody. <sighs> so, yeah, so it's December now. So the, the trial, her trial has been going on for a year. Um, there have been 50 hearings. The whole world has been following this. Um, Amanda Knox and Rafael Solicito, Solicito, sorry, are convicted of the murder of Meredith Kircher. I want to say I'm surprised, but... <laughs> like that was where we were heading right like i i mean ev- in every way they it's not their fault and yet they're in trouble so yeah it seems to be have sadly been this zero percent shocks me yeah they haven't had any comeuppance yet i would say um so amanda sentenced to 26 years in italian prison and <gasps> 26 uh, years yeah i mean rudy was convicted and sentenced to 30 so you know the number of the set the years in the sentencing is what shocks me more than the fact that she got I mean she hadn't even <laughs> been convicted yet and she spent a year and a half so I, I that her get, being found guilty didn't shock me but the amount of years is insane well she, like me, if they really believed she raped and murdered this girl then like you know they're gonna give her a full Christine, sentence please tell me she did not spend all 26 years so in jail. so well she couldn't have because this was in 2009 so oh, you know okay even if but You're right. Jury's out on. I'll I'll update you on what happened. But okay. 
she couldn't have served all of it yet if she's still there, which I'll tell you whether she is or not. Oh, God. Yeah, in 2000. So how many years? She That would have been 25. 2025 she would have come out? No. 2009 plus 25 years. 35? Yeah, 35. Something like okay. that. But she would have been like in her 40s or 50. Like in her. I mean, she. it's, oh my God. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> she would have been like 40. Um, so. Uh, Amanda sentenced to 26 years. Raphael sentenced to 25. And on top of all this, Amanda and Raphael are, uh, are to pay Meredith's family $7 million <gasps> <laughs> in, like, wrongful death, I guess. Um, and also, wait, why did she get an extra year? Oh, because remember, she is, is, a, is a hoe? A mastermind. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. she's a slut. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, apparently so. Damn. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not really sure, but, you know. Okay. Sure. She got an extra and year. Seven million dollars. Yeah, they were ordered to pay that to Meredith's family, and she was ordered to pay Lumumba sixty thousand dollars for defamation, and which pisses me off because I'm like, they literally cornered her into saying that he was there. Like, so basically, the police just said, "Give us sixty thousand dollars." That's what I just heard. <laughs> they were That's like, "What I just heard." You said a terrible thing about him. You should pay him money. And it's like you said it first. It's literally like I dare you to. Say horrible yeah. things, and now also you owe him money because. Oh of wow! Our what dare. a terrible thing to say. It's like wait a second, you oh told God. me to say it. Yeah, so backwards. Uh, so the defamation charges continued as Amanda appeared in court on June first, twenty ten, uh, facing more charges for saying that Italian police beat her during an interrogation. She said police used the threat of physical violence to intimidate and pressure her, which led to falsely accuse Lumumba of Kircher's murder, but officials deny these allegations. And that's according to CNN. So basically the police now took her in for def- defamation for saying that they <laughs> like hit her and pre- like interrogated her in this horrible way. So now they're suing her and it's like... <laughs> Christine? <laughs> it's Christine. Like- Oh my god, this girl can't get a fucking break. Christine, I don't, I really, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have it in me to, I don't know how to, I'm so mad at that, like, so. I know, and I'm used to being mad at the American justice system, which is so fucked in its own way, but it's like, yeah, wow, I'm, now there's new things to be fucked up about a different country's judicial in, system. In my mind, like, I'm always so mad at, like, you know, what's going on over here. I like to think that everything is different in a, in another, in another space, but like they've got their shit handled. Well, and at not. least in this one case, that yeah. is not at all no. the fucking truth. Wow. I mean, humans I'm are humans so are humans. Mad. I don't have much faith in, in a lot of, <sighs> um, this doesn't so the, help. So the, the police beat her and then, <laughs> they and then her. she says they, they hit me. And then they say, we're suing you for defamation. Yeah, how dare you say that? So they, I don't even know why this shocks me anymore. It's just b- baffling. So they hit her in the head. They scream at her. They keep her up for 53 hours, whatever. They they keep her. They don't let her sleep. They don't get her, let her get a lawyer. They speak to her in Italian. They they tell her she has uh, HIV. They make shit up. They, like, psychologically, you know, fuck with her. And then she finally caves, obviously, and says, yeah, okay, fine. This guy did it. And then they say, well, why did you say this guy did it? Why did you say that? And she's like, because you made me. And then they're like, well, we're suing you. How dare you accuse? You know, it's like, they're There's just like being cornered even, and cornered and cornered. I, I don't, like, I don't even know how you get to find peace or, like, get justice for how that. How could like, you ever feel, like, right about anything? Yeah. I, I how do you tell. ever get justice again unless you turn into, like, a superhero and beat the living shit out of these people? Yeah, like, or you, you have to go to, like, a Buddhist temple and spend ten years, like, recovering. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm right. so angry that I can't fathom going through it and recovering mentally. Oh, my God. <sighs> I'm just oh always God. amazed how people get through shit like this. Um, so, <laughs> she maintained her innocence, obviously, and on November 24th, 2010, Amanda and Raphael began the process to appeal their conviction. So this is a whole nother year later. They're appealing the conviction now. Um, and as Amanda's oh lawyer, Luciano uh, Girga, commented, quote, rather than prosecutors having to prove she is guilty, we now have to prove her innocence, which is much more difficult to do. But they try. <laughs> so uh, June 27th, 2011, um, the appeals of Amanda, who's now 23, and remember this all happened when she was 20, so she's been in there for a long uh, time. She's been, she literally went for a year abroad, and now she's fucking stuck in a prison for years. Um, never, and Raphael, if, when this is all over and she gets to go home, if anyone ever tells her, like, oh my god, like, I love living abroad, she's, 
has every she, right to just do you know that i was in. wondering that too i was like what happens if Can she's like watching tv and it's like a, 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 italy is on the, like i think i would be so triggered i can't fathom how i would, would not cope. i would not be able to even probably have a tv or Couldn't even hear italian risk like looking I at be... a book i don't know i mean like Imagine having a kid one day and they're like, I want to go travel abroad. <laughs> Are you no. kidding me? I know. Or like in history class one day and they're learning about Rome, you know, like, are you ki- like, oh, there's a little Sorry. Gio. Oh, Speaking hey. of Italian, quiet. Giovanni loves to, uh, he's so bad. Be a little mouthy. You need to be quiet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good boy. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know how you would cope. I, I, I got angry at Italy. I was like, I don't even have anything to do with I'm this. I'm like <laughs> mad at all of Italy for some I'm reason. Mad at like, I don't even <laughs> want to eat pizza for a whole day. Are you kidding for, me? Till tomorrow, probably. <laughs> like, holy shit, that's how mad I am. <laughs> I would be livid. I mean, truly, if I were her, like, all jokes aside, like, I could not, I no. would never be a. Uh, I would never be okay again. No, me neither. And, like, you can't get peace because everybody knows your fucking name and. And You're, like just the rest while we're at it, throw a slut shaming fest on right, top exactly. of all Exactly, this. That's true too. Oh your reputation's been more than ruined, like in every way imaginable. Um. So. Anyway, uh, so she's appealing this, and she's in court for defamation against Lumumba and the police. Um, they're appealing this a year and a half later. Uh, she's twenty three. Raphael's twenty six, and the appeal begins with fucking rudy is back and he testifies against both of them (laughs) what does he have left to say (laughs) what does what could come out of his like stupid little mouth bored like what like go sit down you're in jail stop you must be bored he's in jail i I guess so like fucking hell so i guess there's been more news about Gede since since the last time he testified so according to bbc uh, this guy who was in prison named Mario Alessi, he was a convicted child murderer. Uh, he was in prison. Great. Great start. He was in prison with Rudy Gede. And I guess <clears throat> Rudy, uh, allegedly, according to Mario Alessi, told him a prison confession during recreation time at Viterbo Prison. And he said that Gede confided in him that Amanda and Raphael were innocent. And, oh. and so he's like, wait, this motherfucker told me that they had nothing to do with it and ah, so okay alessi remembered rudy links arms with me inviting me to take a walk with him he has something important to tell me he said adding that Gede was worried because i don't know whether to tell the truth or not and that the truth all to- is altogether different from what you hear on tv so alessi comes forward and is like well this motherfucker said that like amanda and Raphael weren't even there like he right. told me this at recreation time so then Gede comes forward and is like, that never happened. He's making it up. Blah, blah, blah. And so Amanda, <laughs> Amanda comes onto the, takes a stand and she responds to these statements and says, she is shocked at what he said. And the only time that Rudy, Raphael and I were in one room together was in a courtroom. He knows what the truth is. I don't know what happened that night. So that's <laughs> like, what else can you say? I mean, that's, yeah, that's honestly, all she at this say. point, if I were even... Amanda Knox, if someone ever came up to me and was like, did you do it? After 26 years, I'd be like, what are, I don't, what's the point of me even giving you an answer? Like, why? What do you like, think I'm going to say? I would be so beyond over talking about it. this. Because I'd be like, it's not like my freedom even matters anymore. I just got 26 years of my life taken away from me. So, and like, she, it doesn't matter she, what you think. She has a very, like, striking, like, her eyes are very striking. Um, and so she's very recognizable. And she mm-hmm. said, you know, when she's like in a grocery store, people will be like, I know you. And she's like, I just all I want to she's like, I ignore them. But all I want to do is turn around and be like, you don't know me. <laughs> like, yeah, stop. like, like, what do you know that I apparently have like sexy Halloween parties like, like and then kill people? Like, yeah, you know? that I'm a murderous Halloween know? witch, uh, sex, Ugh. sex deviant. Yeah. It's, that I kissed my boyfriend once. Like, yeah. That's... My Harry Potter boyfriend. Ugh. Anyway, so she says like listen, I don't know what the fuck happened that night. He's the only one who knows and he knows that that, that's the truth. So finally, forensic experts get involved and take all this old evidence, like the bra clasp and the knife, and they're going to run this through a whole new process of forensic analysis, which is great because they're finally like reanalyzing everything to make sure everything's been covered. Uh, Spoiler alert, it has not been 
uh, properly analyzed. What a shock. So two court-appointed experts testify that the knife reportedly used in the attack contained no source of blood. There was no trace of blood on it, um, which they kind of implied there was. They said there was DNA on the knife, but they... There was no blood on the knife and there was no DNA on the bra clasp that police used to implicate Raphael. So these forensic experts are like, no, that's not even true. Like there's, that's just made up. Like they just made it up. Um, So here's a point by point deconstruction. Uh, The experts say that because of the errors made by police during the original investigation, the evidence, all the evidence that they went over should be considered inadmissible. Uh, and yet it fully convicted them. So here are a couple of things. Mm-hmm. There's this forensic expert named Dr. Carla Vecchiotti, and her job was to take the original DNA evidence and uh, reanalyze it for the new trial. And in the Netflix documentary, she said, Contamination was one of the issues raised at court. The bra clasp was found under a small rug 46 days after the murder. After 46 days, it's possible that other people could have brought DNA traces from the hallways or bathroom into Meredith's room. Mm-hmm. In fact, on the clasp, there's Raphael's DNA, but there are also there's also DNA of two unknown males as well. And ah. the police never even mentioned that there's literally you... evidence on her bra of two men. Oh, my God. That just never got brought up. Like, unknown men. Um, their DNA oh. was on the bra. So... A trace of Raphael's was found, but so were two other men. So it's like, wow, you conveniently wow. left that fact out. Ooh, so okay. she also says DNA must be objective. You can't interpret it for what you want it to be. And I must say there were also problems with contamination in the lab. The forensics police definitively identified Amanda's profile. You could see it very well. It was a good profile. But with regards to Meredith's DNA found, it was such a small amount, so scarce. When you have such a scarce DNA, the likelihood of contamination is very high. So oh. with the knife, she said that Amanda's DNA was on the knife, which was at Raphael's house, which makes sense if she cooks there and she hangs out at his apartment and they have dinner together, whatever. It makes sense that her DNA would be on his knife. But she said when they said they found Meredith, that is not provable. It was such a small amount that it can't be certain it was actually Meredith's DNA on the blade of the knife, which mm. was the one thing Amanda said, like, I can't explain why that would be there. And now this expert's like, no, we can't say that's her DNA. It's too small. There's not enough. Mm. You can't say that it's hers. Yeah. So when the investigator asked, when you looked at the knife, were you inspecting it by itself? The forensics police replied, no, we examined 50 of Meredith's samples at the same time. Okay. So all 50 of these were being in the lab at the same time. So the fact that <laughs> so like, the trace, trace could have, like, of it, yeah. it could, uh-huh. It okay. wasn't done like in a very clean, like separate, each piece was separate. They weren't in individual rooms or test up. labs or whatever. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, also like side note is there when they're doing all of these trials is there also a language barrier there like are they just having a translator come in and, i think like... there's probably translators because i'm pretty sure amanda at this point is speaking english in in her testimony okay um i will say by the time she like this you see her like at the end of this ordeal she's like speaking italian pretty well so i think right well if that's all you've got prison. if that's all you've got to do with your time and also like it's like life or death and that like it's the only way you can communicate with everybody yeah, yeah. talk about like an immersive, immersive. experience <laughs> wow i mean who well, needs because i needs also duolingo you oh. just like get arrested in italy Jeez, yeah well also i because i i wonder how much I mean, it's such a small amount of trauma compared to the rest, but imagine the additional fear in the middle of a trial when you can't even understand the lawyers defending you when they're in the middle of a courtroom. Yeah, know? when there's, like, idioms and things that get already got you in trouble. Yeah, oh, I, every every second I would be so uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there were, uh, that they were speaking their native tongue and that um, there were translators because her quotes are pretty intricate um Mm -hmm. now i want to add remember when you said like we're not (laughs) eating pizza till tomorrow Uh so (laughs) are we not eating pizza till next week is that what i'm hearing (laughs) no we can eat pizza tomorrow don't worry uh i'm just gonna tell you about what donald trump had to say during this whole what the fuck christine (laughs) what That, look, at this point, what curveball couldn't hit me square in the face? You sound like Donald Trump is what I'm saying. Oh, so it God. Cuts, it cuts, during this documentary, cuts to a clip of Donald Trump. Like, he was not 
president at this point, right? Like he's he's not even running. Like this is 2011. So this mofo gets on TV and says, and they're like, so you think the president should get involved? And he goes, the president should get involved. We should boycott Italy. <laughs> so oh he my god, has so this he grand has plan. <laughs> never changed. Sounds oh, like it's so on point. Like. Gross. We should boycott Italy. The well, dumb shit he unfortunately, says. so the second I said I shouldn't eat pizza anymore, did you just? <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's boycott pizza for tomorrow. A, for once, Donald Trump and I have something in common, I guess. Wow. <laughs> I don't think he boycotted jack shit, though, so don't worry. You're more committed. <laughs> Great. <sighs> yeah, so that was just a stupid quote they stuck in there. We should boycott Italy. Like, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? Nothing. Okay. God. So. Anyway, so the other crucial piece of evidence that this Dr. Carlo Vecchiati enlightens us with is about the kitchen knife in the drawer. So Mm. that was found at Raphael's house. So detectives had already claimed this is the murder weapon. Amanda's DNA is on the handle and Meredith's DNA is on the blade. And like I said, Amanda was like, I don't even that one I can't explain that one I have no explanation for. So during the appeal, forensic specialists testified that the quality of the DNA sample on the blade was too small to be reliable as evidence and not only that so i'd already said like there was too much too little of it to even confirm scientifically that it was meredith but on top of that then they looked at her wounds and said these don't even this knife doesn't even match her her wounds like her stab wounds what it doesn't the murder weapon does not even match this out how how long after all of the after they had to appeal her like she was already convicted for this murder who didn't realize that? I feel like Terrible. that's exactly what... Okay. And this motherfucker, Giuliano, keeps saying, oh, well, I still think she's guilty. And it's like, you know what? There's something to be said for people who refuse to learn when they're wrong. To refuse to accept being wrong. Like, that's just... Yeah. There's something to be said for, like, you won't accept being corrected. Like, right. It's Oh, foolish. my God. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's... 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 Uh, and it's dangerous can we fast forward to the part where this gets like a good <laughs> like we have like a we're happy yeah um we can just... have pizza tomorrow <laughs> is okay. that comforting <laughs> just look forward to that um so all in all um according to injustice in org, uh, the following evidence was stacked up against Gede specifically who's already been convicted but this okay. is just proof evidence at least that he acted in this alone Okay. He admitted he was in the room. His DNA was found in and on Meredith's body. His DNA, along with Meredith's blood, was found on Meredith's purse. His excrement was found in the toilet. Oh, it was his. It was his. Mm -hmm. His shoe prints were discovered in her blood uh, and were found in the bathroom or in the bedroom and the hallway. Uh Uh-huh. His handprint in Meredith's blood was found on a pillowcase in her room. He had a cut on his right hand that was still visible when he's arrested and he had fled the country. So all uh-huh. of that, and they're still like, oh, no, but Amanda orchestrated the whole thing. I, <laughs> Which, <laughs> just baffling. Who is running this? Who is? Okay. It's well, fucking Giuliano. I'm telling you. It's, it's I mean, this Minini, is so. Mr. Meany. This is so stupid. Like, at this point, like, he has to not be sleeping well, right? Like, there's no way he believes still that Amanda Knox is responsible. He does, and he keeps making a point of, like, about how Catholic he is. And, like, they literally show him in a Catholic church, and he's like, he's like, they will pay in the afterlife. And I'm like, you are a... You will pay in the afterlife. Are you fucking son of a me? bitch. I, I just kept wondering, I wonder what happens after we die, and do you find out, like, that you really fucked up big time? I don't know. Yeah, like, what, like, also... Uh, Okay, so he's so. Catholic and like what? Like and also like, so her being like affectionate with her boyfriend was like just such a sin that it's now like I his really vendetta think a lot against of it, God. Like, what I is really this? think a lot of it was him looking at her as like this wretched like Hussy, Bathsheba harlot. type, yeah, like harlot from the Bible. Like she's she's re- leading these men astray, like. I really think I a feel lot like of it at was some point he way. had to figure out like s- logically it was not her fault, but he'd already committed so I wonder hard that he if, just like, has to say yes. Yeah, I wonder if like you get time. to a point where you just can't and you, it's too late to go back. You know, I wonder. Um, he got promoted later anyway, so we'll get there. But <laughs> yeah, no <So>, comment. <laughs> September twenty seventh, two thousand eleven. Uh, Celestito's Raphael's lawyer 
Julia Bongiorno, hammers all of it home, saying that the media portrays Amanda as a femme fatale, comparing her to the cartoon character Jessica Rabbit, who protests, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way, in the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh my god. She says, there is no physical evidence placing Amanda and Raphael at the scene of the crime. She attacks the credibility of the DNA evidence and says Amanda's statements to police the night of the murder should be discounted because of the hostile questioning by police. Mm. So... That's how that's their rebuttal, but like we all know that already. Um, right. Okay. October third, two thousand eleven, an appellate court jury of six citizens and two judges overturned their convictions. Wow. How long did it take, though? Um. So that was October of twenty eleven. Twenty eleven. Yeah. So she's been in there since two thousand eight. So yeah, like three years. <laughs> oh my god. So the judge wrote, even taken all together, the evidence did not prove in any way the guilt of Amanda Knox and Raphael Celestito for the crime. Um, Obviously, Amanda is overcome by emotion and she like collapses and her lawyers like help carry her out of the court. She leaves Italy immediately. Uh, Well, duh. Duh. (laughs) Also, like, (laughs) let's take a moment to like, we are talking about Amanda Knox. We are not talking enough about her Harry Potter boyfriend. What's his name again? Raphael. Raphael. That man also deserves, uh, like, the uh, the energy we're giving a- Amanda. Of, oh, like, completely. That man was still also in jail for three years. Yeah. And he was the, around, and he, the whole time. he was, like, even less involved. He, he was, like, like, was two degrees away from this person. Yeah. He was, like, my girlfriend is, like, getting accused of murder. And all of a sudden, like, I'm part of the alibi that didn't work. And now, yeah. like, I'm in trouble. Like, that, uh, did they break up? So, yeah. So, apparently, while they were in jail, he wrote to her and said, I still have feelings for you. And she was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Like, it was just really uh, heartbreaking. The whole thing was so really sad. sad. I wonder, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't blame her. How like, could, right. No, like, I feel all. like any, anything related to that experience could not be a happy one. It's like the one time eventually. where you could be like, like truthfully be like, it's not you. It's me. I'm going through a lot right now. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, no, it's but not, literally I'm going it's through a lot. It's not you. It's just like the entire nation it's makes the me justice sad. justice system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's this oh, guy, Giuliano. That poor guy. Like, so uh, for all the, the energy we're giving Amanda, let's, uh, everyone also gives snacks yes. to this guy because I hope he's doing well. Oh my God. Oh, uh, well, he has a cute Twitter profile pic, so I guess he's winning in that regard. Yeah. Um, so, blah, blah, blah. They overturn it. Amanda jumps on a fucking plane and is out of there. And, uh, mm-hmm. obviously, she returns home to Seattle. Um, it's pretty fucked up because her dad is, like, outside the house and the media has, like, swarmed their front yard. And he's standing there and they're, like, <laughs> one of the journalists is, like, well, you know, you only have a couple weeks left before she's not a hot ticket anymore and you're not going <gasps> to get much money out of this story. Like, you know that, right? I mean, I'm sure they're trying to bait him, but it's so fucked up. And he goes, sorry, I don't quite look at my daughter as a hot ticket for the media. Right. But... I, I think of my daughter as someone I haven't gotten to see in three years because Because uh, she's XYZ. been wrongly accused of. Yeah. It, yeah. And it was just like, what do you expect him to say? Like, you're right. We should call Harper Collins. I don't know. It's right. just such yeah. a bizarre he was clearly trying to bait this man, but it was like, oh, my God, how, like, low do we have to stoop people? Um, so she signs a book deal with Harper Collins. fun fact. <laughs> so, well, I was going to say, with that book money, please tell me she tried to, like, sue the cops for defamation. Back. <laughs> so she does do good things with her future, which is great. But, I mean, I get it. I would write a book, too. I'd be like, listen, I need, A, to process this somehow, and yeah. B, to, like, share my side of this fucking story when everybody else has been slut shaming me across the headlines for three years i don't i don't blame her for one second for also like i need fucking money like i yes, don't have right. a job like, right also <laughs> in the middle of college me. i got put in prison and like yeah, you took a career what? from me yeah so and she can't just go work at the dairy queen because like everybody recognizes her so it's right. like anyway so that's not the end <laughs> sorry There's what more. i thought that was it no Christine, I don't think I can do it anymore. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're I'm, I'm really sorry. Up. Okay, what? just when you thought this was all over, two years later, March of 2013, Italy's highest court, the Court of Cassation, reopens the case. <gasps> now, this is another thing. Well, I guess I'll quote the New York Times. I was going to try to explain it, but I'll let the New York Times do that job. 
Quote, this highlights the divide between the legal systems of Italy and the United States where defendants cannot be tried twice for the same crime after an acquittal. In the U.S., if you're acquitted, you're good. You can't be recharged for that crime. Not so in Italy, my friends. So for the rest of her life, she just she gets to live in fear? She right back into that fucking trial. So she never gets to feel safe ever again. Mm-hmm. This woman is still alive. Mm-hmm. And at any moment, she just has to be prepared to, like, go back to jail for another three years. Yeah, I don't know if there's, like, a limit. Like, maybe you can only be tried twice. Like, I don't know how. I don't know the details. But, that yeah, so she thought she was. Woman, she never gets to feel safe again. Yeah, she thought she was fucking free. Now they call two years later and are like, oh, actually, we reopened it because, according to The Guardian, prosecutors argued that the Perugia court that acquitted them has lost its or had lost its bearings in the case and had erred in numerous ways. And it's like. We already determined that y'all fucked up to begin with. Now you're saying they fucked up. Whatever. So Knox, who was obviously in Seattle and was ready to release her book, was devastated. Um, she said the prosecution's theory of my involvement in Meredith's murder has been repeatedly revealed to be completely unfounded and unfair. And yet again, the trial begins again. And also, just so we're clear, like, she kissed her boyfriend once and was considered a slut for the rest of and time. And then it got And now she's across. writing a book after this. She is going to be seen as such a clout chaser. Yep. And, yep, like, yep, this yep, is yep. just proof. Like, all of it was for money. Oh, my God. And she okay. doesn't even have a 15-year-old living in her in her house. Yeah. Having a... A sexual relationship with a 15 year old like some fucking catholics do allegedly alleged allegedly thank you um so anyway retrial begins on september 20th nope 30th 2013 uh and neither <laughs> i don't blame her amanda nor rafael are present for this trial they're home um so rafael takes the stand uh i guess like virtually where he describes his charges as absurd and the evidence against him as an illusion. And he continues, there was not a basis to charge me to put me in jail. I don't wish anybody on earth to go through what I went through. Mm. And Amanda basically sends an email writing the same sort of thing. She wrote in Italian. I must repeat to you. I'm innocent. I did not rape. I did not steal. I did not kill Meredith. So on January 30th of 2014, after 11 and a half hours of deliberation, the jury once again, convict amanda <gasps> and Raphael for a second time oh my god oh my god oh my fucking god and so because of this the judge adds two and a half years to their original sentences so now she has 27 and a half and he has 26 and a half <laughs> who sorry can you remind me again who reopened this and why like the why? italy's highest court it went all the way up to the highest court and they reopened it because they said that the the last trial had been done basically insufficiently and forensically was deficient in the way they so what, at what was the evidence in this that this time around that like really like you know was i'm so mind-blowing i'm not sure i, I i'm I'm not sure what they could have said to be like, actually, the knife did have her DNA. Like, my guess is they had other forensic experts come in and say, no, it probably is Meredith's DNA. Like, I'm not really sure. That's my guess, but. (sighs) Ooh, I don't think I've ever really been so affected. I think maybe a a couple weeks ago or something, there was one that, like, really got me going. And, like, I think this beats it. Yeah, this one's so infuriating. Um, We're thankfully almost the end, but. Uh, Amanda, Raphael, their families, the entire world was like stunned, especially in the U.S. when you're used to like if you get off or you're convicted or you're acquitted, you're fine. Like you're with that charge, you're done. Like you don't need to face trial for that again. But everyone was shocked. So uh, let's see. Obviously, they still maintain their innocence. On May 1st of 2014, Amanda did an interview with CNN where she asserted, I did not kill my friend. I did not wield a knife. I had no reason to. She's probably ingrained these into her fucking brain by now. Yeah, she, it's probably her daily affirmation. Yeah, like literally, yeah. So then on March 27, 2015, an Italian Supreme Court, thank the Lord, overturned Amanda's conviction for the murder of her roommate, Meredith Kircher. So she and Raphael were finally free. I'm guessing there's probably some limit on how many times you can retry somebody because now apparently they're they're good like they're good they're out of there so how did they why did they overturn it again like what? it was just the same kind of process all over again their lawyers appealed it they brought the same you know forensic evidence to the table does this mean said, they had to like sit in jail again while they waited no, for all this i don't think so i think it was going through 
the appeals process and they were just waiting. Okay. Um, so they thought they were going to end up going back to jail. <laughs> um, but Can you thankfully... imagine having to relive your nightmare? And like after everything no. you went through for three years, almost that exact same amount of time, you're finally done with this crisis. You're home. And you're home. You're safe. You're, you're like, that was the worst nightmare I'll ever have to go through. And then all of a sudden someone calls ring, ring. you and says, <laughs> hey, you have to relive it all. And it's just, even if she didn't have to do it, the, or and Raphael too, but the mental torture of knowing, like, this is what you get to go back to at it's any It's always moment. hovering over your head. And, wow. And so, thank God, it was, like, months later that they started the appeals process, so they didn't have to go back yet. But if that oh. appeal hadn't gone through, they would have had to go back and go to prison for 27 years. So, <clears throat> she, uh, it was really cool because they had video footage of her finding out that, like, the, the verdict. And so she was at home with her family and she just starts screaming. Like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And then she calls Raphael and she's like in Italian. She's like, Raphael, we're free. We did it. Like, we don't have to go back. And I'm, I'm like, shocked that that was her reaction. Cause I would have been like, again, like at, at that point I would be like at any moment, they're going to say, never mind again. You I know. know it's, it's just so heartbreaking. Cause like the amount of emotion still so many years later that you're still probably having to go through and deal with, like, I don't know how you don't, <laughs> I'm also, I do think it's really precious that her and Raphael did bond through this. Yes, like, yeah. It's horrible, but even though they were at no they longer had dating. they something in common, like, I mean, you've got end. no one else that knows who you've been right. through. Right, who else like, understands this? Exactly. So she called him, and it was really sweet, because, like, even though they're obviously not together anymore, she was, like, in Italian. And that's when I noticed, wow, her Italian's a lot better. Wow. Um, so, but she was like, we're free, we did it, we don't, and I was like, wow, this is, and her family's sobbing. I mean, it's. It's heart wrenching. Um, mm. So thank the Lord she got it appealed again. Um, so uh, Amanda and Raphael were finally free, and she said in a statement, "The knowledge of my innocence has given me strength in the darkest times of this ordeal, and throughout this ordeal, I've received invaluable support from my family, friends, and strangers. To them, I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your kindness has sustained me. I only wish that I could thank each and every one of you in person." So September of 2015. The Italian Supreme Court released their explanation behind the verdict, saying they blamed stunning flaws in the investigation and increased media attention for creating a frantic search for guilty parties. The justices find a complete lack of biological traces connecting Knox and Celestito to the crimes. The court said evidence still points to the guilt of Rudy Gede. Okay, like I could have told you that five years ago, but all right, glad we're finally all there. Um, And as final icing on the cake, on January 24th, 2019, the European Court of Human Rights ordered Italy to pay Knox more than $20,000 in damages for the interrogation. And in her blog, she commented, I am grateful for their wisdom in acknowledging the reality of false confessions and the need to reform police interrogation methods. Mm. Which still happens in the U.S. Wrongful convictions happen here. Coerced confessions happen here. More than we'd like to think. Um, So at least this is being drawn, you know, some attention is being drawn to that issue. And this is the last bit here. According to a 2010, nope, 2021 In Touch Weekly article, Amanda has been married to a man named Christopher Robinson, which, wow, that sounds a lot like Christopher Robin. Christopher Robin. Yeah. Christopher Robin, but uh, married to Christopher Robinson since February of 2020. So very recent. Wow. Um, Right right before the pandemic. Yay. Uh, (laughs) She got, she snuck that in there. Uh, where guests had to wear costumes. Um, Fun! I know, it's kind of cute, because I remember when this came out in the news, and I was like, oh, what a strange update to the Amanda yeah. Knox case. Like, everyone's in <laughs> costumes. Okay. Huh. Um, so, she they're now expecting a baby. Aww. Very happy for them. Um, they worked on a true crime podcast together called <gasps> The Truth About True Crime with Amanda Knox, and it ran for Good four for seasons. I know, I was like, badass, man. And they now co-host a podcast called Labyrinths, which is about navigating their own personal mazes in life. And I'm like, oh, man, she really, like, she, fucking owned this shit. Wow, good for her. I know. So, as mentioned in the beginning, she has a Medium blog where she updates, what did I call them, blog articles? Yikes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she updates them regularly. And in 2017, she said she was devoting herself to writing and activism for the wrongly accused, which is great. Sure. And Raphael himself is engaged to his partner, Andrea... So they're happy, Yay. hopefully, too. Um, and finally, as far as Meredith's family, because, again, it just kind of wrecks my heart that, like, her whole story was just sidelined yeah. by this, which is, like, yeah. her tragedy is the biggest of all. You know, she was brutally yeah. raped and murdered. 
But so according to Sydney Morning Herald, uh, the Kircher family still celebrates Meredith's birthday. They honor her on the anniversary of her death. Mm. Her father, John Kircher, has written a book called Meredith, Our Daughter's Murder and the Heartbreaking Quest for the Truth. And he writes, so Meredith, this book is for you and all the people who loved and love you still. Aww. So if you want to watch the documentary, it's a great, it has the same, um, <laughs> the same viewpoint that I hold, which is, okay. <laughs> which is like, what the fuck were they thinking? Yeah. Um, but there's plenty of documentaries online, books, etc. So, you know, form your own opinion happily. I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but I'll tell you what I believe. So that's yeah. where I stand. Yeah. Wow. The end. Finally. No more. I'm Xing out the page. No more fucking like we're reopening the case. No more retrials. Goodbye. Oh my gosh. I'm that. So, that you you told it well, Christine, but wow, I just am not happy that you had to tell it at all. My God, I, when there was a break in the page and it was like, and she wrote a book. But then <laughs> it's like no For a second I was like, Whoo, out the clear. <laughs> so sorry. Yikes. Well, I hope she's doing well. Sounds like mm-hmm. she's doing well. Having a little COVID quarantine baby. I know. I should and look at that. Look at look it up. See if um, see when babies do. Yes, yeah, same due date as you, maybe. Aww. Well, um, yikes. Do we have an update on your baby yet? Oh on yeah. The size? I did have a fun one today. I found out that the baby's the size. This is actually early. This is for one. We're recording this week, but baby's the size of a Foreman girl, a George Foreman girl. Oh my gosh, Michael Scott could burn his foot on your baby. <laughs> oh my god, you're right. Wow. That's, That's pretty, pretty big, fun. huh? That's and big according baby. to uh, What to Expect app, uh, the baby is the size of Winnie the Pooh's jar of honey. Which is funny because Christopher Robinson. Christopher Robin, which is Robinson, which is also funny because I just bought a bunch of Winnie the Pooh prints for the nursery. So Fun. Fun stuff. Yeah, is, is Winnie the Pooh your baby theme? I love Winnie the Pooh. It's one of the, I don't really have a theme, but it's definitely like a one of the elements <laughs> like i feel like, like we talked about this recently yes, we did. Like, i, we I did. had a crush on rabbit yeah, yeah yeah yeah. yes oh my god i love winnie the pooh so much i got some really great little prints from etsy oh and then the other one according to is uh, a doc martin's boot oh well too. remember i i remember you and your vegan doc martin stomping well. around in those neon pink <laughs> there's nothing christine liked more when we were on tour than wearing those doc martins and every time someone pointed at them she'd go they're vegan they're vegan they're magenta <laughs> and they're vegan wow good times uh, well anyway. so your baby has fashion and also can sizzle some bacon very well oh Fun what a stunner well all right, I guess I'm going to go back to Los Angeles now. Yeah, have a good so. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we drink. <laughs>